It was in June of 1972 that my mom and dad told me they were taking a couple of our thoroughbred racehorses to Durango, Colorado, where my father owned land, and where we typically boarded some of the animals during the summer. This trip was nothing unusual, as it occurred rather frequently. The only difference this time was that my mother was going with my dad instead of me. I guess Dad figured that at 13, I was old enough and responsible enough to do the morning and evening chores, which consisted of feeding and watering the remaining horses, which numbered about eight, a few cows, six pigs, and a coop full of chickens. There were also always a few wounds that needed to be smeared with ointment. These chores were not exactly rocket science, but it did take a while, so I was glad when Lyle offered to come and help me with each evening. He got a kick out of it, as he enjoyed that kind of thing. I, however, leaned more towards the arts. Performing magic, singing, playing the piano, and even doing ventriloquism. In fact, I did it professionally by the time I was 12. I had no intention of staying at the house alone while my parents were gone to Colorado. I was very much afraid of the dark, and especially of being alone. It would be years until I discovered why. I was going to spend the weekend with two of my best friends, Lyle and Mark Harper. Lyle was a year older than I was, and Mark was a year younger, so I fit right into the middle of the two. They lived just three houses to the west of my house. I can't really call it a house that I lived in. It was one of four duplexes that my dad owned. Two of them were built back in the early 1920s, and the other two were newer, as they were built by my dad a couple of years after we moved there in the late 1960s. The two old units, A and B, and the two new units, C and D, were split down the middle by our long asphalt driveway. The only other building on the property was a very old and very large white stucco garage slash shop, which was located behind the units at the end of the driveway. Beyond that old shop was where the corrals and pastures were. With my parents in Colorado, I was in charge of keeping all the animals fed. Darkness was just around the corner, so I took Lyle and we headed to my place. As we entered my driveway, we started walking between the old units and the new units toward the big garage. What made this shop unique were the giant rolling stainless steel doors. One on the left and one on the right that met in the middle. It created an almost mirror effect, but not quite shiny enough to be an actual mirror. I happened to be looking at the door, noticing how the street light created just enough glow to make our stretched shadows lightly appear on the big metal doors. I commented to Lyle that I wished I was that tall in real life, and that is when it happened. With both of us looking at our very light shadows bouncing to the rhythm of our steps, another shadow, only very dark, no, black. So black that it looked like a thick, inky, one-dimensional entity ran clumsily across the shiny door from left to right. It was wearing what looked like a wide-brimmed fedora hat. It had a troll-like appearance, all hunched over as though it didn't want to be seen. It scurried quickly in total darkness until it reached the right side of the doors, after which it completely disappeared. We both stopped, frozen in our tracks, trying to comprehend what we had just witnessed. Before either of us could say anything, the thick, dark shadow man trotted back the other direction, once again disappearing as it reached the other side of the doors. Both of our minds instantly realized that nothing solid had run between us and the doors, and that the only way a shadow could be that dark was, well, there was just no way a regular shadow could be that dark. Without uttering a word, we both turned in sync, as though the movement was choreographed, and took off running back onto 8th Avenue. Neither of us stopped until we arrived back at the safety of Lyle's house. Once inside, we ran to his father, Lloyd, who was watching the news on television, and told him that we needed him. We related our experience, and he said that he was sure that there was a logical explanation. I knew, though, that there was not. He walked back to my house with us, and we began to experiment, attempting to recreate a shadow that was as dark as what we had just seen ten minutes before. 
It just wasn't possible. Mr. Harper agreed to stay with us while I did my chores in the now dark back pasture area. It would be years later that I would learn about shadow figures and how they operate. Since then, I have been blessed, or cursed, with several paranormal experiences, from full-body apparitions to simply feeling the presence of spirits. I'm not sure why me, but I am grateful. I have been fascinated by ghosts and the supernatural my entire life. I've had a few experiences here and there, but this one in particular was the most significant and frightening. First, some background. My dad's side of the family is Native American, and some have a deep suspicion of owls. They're considered evil omens. Anyways, my grandmother was very, very attuned to spirits. She had the so-called second sight. She had a whole wealth of stories about her encounters with the paranormal, who she passed on to my aunt. But anywho, this next bit is relevant. A few months before she passed away from lupus, she woke up in a panic and came running into my aunt's room. My grandmother was generally a stoic, unflappable woman, so this was not like her. She dragged my aunt into her bedroom, asking if she heard it. My aunt heard nothing. What my grandmother had heard was the so-called death owl. She passed on not too long after that. Fast forward about ten years or so, I'm up around 4 a.m. watching TV. As I recall, it was around December of 2008. I heard this noise outside. It sounded like a woman weeping. The best way I can describe it was a voice that was caught between an owl's cry and a human's. It was very unnatural. I got a cold feeling in my gut because I knew. I knew exactly what it was, and it scared the ever-loving crap out of me. I remember being paralyzed with fear. I grew up out in the country, and I know what an owl sounds like. I've also heard bobcats, foxes, and the dying screams of rabbits. This? This was none of those things. Others have tried to claim that it was just an animal, but it was like no other animal I've ever heard. That, that unearthly wailing noise. Like it was in mourning. It was the kind of sound that freezes the blood in your veins. At the time, I thought it might be foretelling my father's imminent death, since if you hear it, it either means that you or a family member is going to die. Or... It predicts great disaster. And for clarification at the time, my dad was having some significant heart trouble. But he's much better now. Now comes the twist. On April 9th, 2009, a huge wildfire swept through my area. A lot of houses burned down, and mine was among them. When we came back, my home was nothing but a pile of smoking rubble. It took me a bit to make the connection, but I am positive that the Death Owl, or Banshee, was an omen that predicted this disaster. One thing's for sure, I hope to God that I never hear that thing again, because I will never forget it. I have a suspicion that this thing stalks my family. I can't be certain. I'll have to do some research into my family tree. I know this might sound unbelievable to some, but I swear till the day that I die that this is all 100% true. So there you have it, folks. My most significant paranormal encounter.
My girlfriend and I often get bored with our hometown, so we travel our state a lot exploring abandoned places. Some of these places are also deemed to be haunted. I'm browsing on my computer one day, and I find this prison located about three hours away from us. We decide to drive out there on the upcoming 4th of July because we figured that no one would be there for the holiday. This prison was very large, with ten or so buildings ranging from cell blocks to indoor workout areas. All of these buildings were surrounded by guard towers and fencing that was impossible to enter without breaking the chain links. We parked behind these trees in the front parking lot and walked up to the main building entrance used for prisoner intake. Lucky for us, the front door was simply opened, and we could have just walked right in. We passed through that building, and here we are now inside the prison itself. It's a very large, open space with sidewalks and courtyards connecting the buildings. However, there were little things that seemed off about the whole place. Dead crows that lined the sidewalks were the most noticeable. It was like they flew over the prison and just fell out of the sky. Even the graffiti was made up of weird symbols that we didn't understand. We passed all that a little on edge now, and as we walked, I saw letters on the buildings. A, B, C were regular cell blocks. When we passed B, I thought to myself that we should check it out because B is the first letter of my name. Odd thought to have, but I went with it. The cell blocks formed the shape of a T, and in the middle of the T was a guard station with a ladder leading them to the second floor if they needed to go up there without having to interact with the inmates. This upstairs area connected to a hallway that led to a boiler room and a door with stairs leading down the side of the building. I walked up those stairs and passed the boiler room, but I stopped dead in my tracks when I got to this hallway. I shined my phone flashlight into the hallway, and even though it was daytime outside, my light only went one inch into this area. I felt myself shiver even though I live in the south, and it's 90 degrees outside. I ask out loud if anyone is here with us to make yourself known. I'm sure this was a mistake, but I didn't mean it negatively. I just felt compelled to say it. From this pitch black darkness, I hear a noise that sounded like something scurrying away, such as a small animal. I figure that's all it was. I figure that's all it was that made me nervous when all of a sudden I hear footsteps full on sprinting directly at me. It sounded like whatever it was had massive feet and could run unnaturally fast. I ran out of the building and down the stairs with my girlfriend right in front of me. We both looked at each other and determined that whatever it was did not want us here. We ended up walking around just a little bit more to other parts of the property, but we felt watched the entire time. As we departed through the front door, we felt better, almost as if we were being released from an unpleasant fog of energy. We had sage in the car and burned some, which also helped us feel better. I try not to think about it often, but I do wonder what we encountered. This was probably the scariest thing to happen to me in real life. It took place a couple months ago while I was sightseeing the West Coast. I was visiting a small, quiet beach town in Oregon called Newport. It's basically situated on a cliff, and then down below is the beach. The beach itself is basically empty, and it is huge. It goes on for endless miles and seems like something out of a movie. I've never seen something so vast in my whole life. Anyway. I had spent most of the entire day on the beach, and when it got dark, I climbed back up the cliff to where my car was. I had originally planned to sleep on the beach in a tent, but it was starting to rain, so I figured I would just sleep in my car. I had been traveling all over Oregon and California for the last month, seeing national parks and stuff, and sleeping in my car most nights anyway. And this was literally the perfect, quiet little beach town, so I figured no big deal. I got to my car, which was parked in this public lot for beachgoers at the top of the cliff, but next to my car was the sign that said no overnight parking that I hadn't seen before, so I figured dang, 
I guess I'll just go to another spot close by. So I looked on the maps on my phone and saw that ten minutes away on the outside of town was a nature preserve. As I mentioned earlier, I had been staying at national parks and stuff, so I figured that it would be a nice place to sleep. The weather was beginning to get significantly worse, and I figured I should hurry. I drove there pretty fast, and by the time I did get there, it was completely dark and storming. I entered the nature preserve, which was a single road that followed the cliff line on the coast for a couple minutes with nothing but trees on one side and beach on the other. No cars, no houses, no buildings, no people for what seems like forever. As I drove down the road a little ways, I began to feel uneasy. It all seemed a little creepy, and I felt really alone, but the moon was shining bright through the clouds, and the beach was visible, so I figured I was all right. I found a great peak spot on the cliff overlooking the beach, and decided to back my car up on it and rest. I opened up the back of my jeep and climbed in, and went to sleep. After a few hours, I woke up. I wasn't sure what had caused me to wake up, but there I was, awake. By this time, the storm had turned into a full-blown monsoon. I could barely see out my windows, the rain was so thick, but I could hear the waves of the ocean down below crashing against the beach and the wind was blowing so loud that my car was shaking. I noticed water was pouring in through the cracks of my Jeep, and I tried to reach for my phone so I could turn the light on, but I realized I left it in the front, which was blocked by all my luggage, and the only way to get there was to open up the back and step outside. I was about to open the latch and let myself out, and that was when I heard it. Laughter. It sounded like a child at first, playing, but soon I realized it had to be someone older. They had to be close to the car, too, because it was raining so hard there's no way I could hear it if it was far away. I figured it might be a cop telling me to move, but then again, it had to be like three or four in the morning, and why would they be all the way out here in this weather anyway? I froze to listen and then I could tell that it was getting closer. I obviously wanted to look up to see, but the way my jeep was parked was backing up to the end of the cliff facing the beach, and my luggage was literally stuffed all the way through the rest of the vehicle, blocking all side and front windows. I was crammed in the way back, so at the time I was literally trapped and could only see out the back window. It was at that moment that I realized how helpless I was. Her voice grew louder and louder. I could tell now that it was in no way a cop. She was laughing hysterically, the top of her lungs, screaming, ah, ha, 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 ha. By the steady increasing of volume, I could tell she was definitely coming up to my car, and then between laughs, I heard her creepy voice say, Oh, well, 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 what are you doing all the way out here? My heart dropped. Her voice sounded exactly like Bellatrix Lestrange from Harry Potter, and I immediately thought to myself, Oh my god, I am going to die. I sat there, frozen, solid. I didn't want to move. I remember thinking to myself, this is not happening, this is not happening, this is not happening. But it was. With the storm raging outside my car, my phone being nowhere in reach, me being trapped in the back of the jeep with no easy exit, on the edge of a cliff in the middle of nowhere, with maniacal, laughing women getting closer and closer, I was literally living in a full-blown horror film. The only thing I could do was wait. I sat there for a few more moments, and then that's when I saw her. I had poked my head up just a bit to see out the tiny space of visible window that looked to the side of my vehicle. About ten feet or so from the jeep, I could see through the thick rain and heavy fog a woman standing there facing not me, thank God, but the edge of the cliff toward the beach. 
Her arms were flaying up and down rapidly like a bird, and her head was twitching increasingly fast, all over in irregular patterns. Her clothes were ripped, and her voice was broken, and she literally looked like the zombies on The Walking Dead. I couldn't move. Literally all the fears built up in my head of what the source of this hysterical laughter may be came true in that second. I tried rationalizing the situation to myself like, she's on drugs, she's lost her mind, or this is someone joking, or literally anything. But every time I tried, I would peek back up and see that this is something unexplicable. It made no sense. How the hell would someone be out here in what I'm pretty sure was a Category 5 monsoon, five miles away from anything, no car, freezing temperature, standing up, screaming in the dead of night? I just couldn't believe it. She kept laughing hysterically, shaking her body all over as if she were fully possessed. I couldn't understand what words she was shouting in between laughs, but it sounded demonic. I was mortified. By the grace of God, I ended up finding a significantly large hunting knife stowed away in the bag next to me in the back of the jeep, and after taking one last good look at this bewildered, wild devil witch woman, I decided it was time to say a prayer and try my best to sleep. I honestly don't know how I managed to do that because if I remember right, she probably stayed there for another 30 minutes, howling at the moon. But somehow I did. And the next morning when I woke up, I slowly stepped out of my jeep, knife in hand of course, and I looked around. And there was nobody there. It was as if it had never happened. The sun was shining now, and the beach was calm. It was just me, and me, Alone. It's 12.44 a.m. and 10 minutes ago, I saw a ghost. I live in the basement, which is almost finished, so it isn't the creepy, empty stages anymore. It's really comfortable and homey. Today, though, my parents are putting up a new wall separating my room from the laundry room, so that's the change. It's a little uncomfortable tonight, and I do admit that having such an open space where I could see and not see everything is a little spooky, but I wasn't actively thinking about it, and I was actually really relaxed and just scrolling through TikTok on my phone. This is the setup. I have my bed in the middle of the room, my TV is adjacent from me, on, playing Family Guy. I'm facing left, which is facing the laundry room, and the almost built wall. There's a small landing that goes to my sister's room, which is also in the basement. The back storage room, which the light was on, and then the stairs that go up. My fan, which is also to my left, is on. I can't hear a whole lot besides the fan, my phone, and the TV. My phone is positioned almost directly in front of my face, but with what I saw, it was not in my peripheral. It was directly next to my phone screen, so I clearly saw it. A half-white figure walked past from the landing into the laundry room. I could only see the bottom half of it. It was clearly opaque white. I thought it was my dog at first, so I sat up and called her name a few times, but she didn't come. Then I thought maybe it was my parents and they just couldn't hear me. But I didn't see the laundry room light turn on, or the washing machine or anything turn on. So I turned on my flashlight and called my dog's name again, thinking that she might be getting into something. When she still didn't come to me, I got up with my flashlight still on and turned the bedroom light on. Then I checked everything out to see if it was my dog, and if she was just being silly, or maybe even if it was a cat. Nothing was there. So I got freaked out and went to my sister's room, which her light was on, and the storage room light was on. My sister wasn't in her room, she was in the garage. So I told her what had happened, and she thinks my mind is probably just playing tricks on me since there's changes going on downstairs, and it's a little scary down there right now. Which, I admit, it is, but I was really comfortable, and about to go to sleep. 
I have been in those instances where I freak myself out, like watching a scary movie or something, and I convince myself that I heard or saw something, but of course nothing happened, and I sleep fine. But tonight it was different. I just know it. As soon as I figured out that it wasn't my dog or my parents or any cats, I began to feel nauseous and my heart started pounding. Now, this isn't the first time a paranormal experience has happened in this house. It's just the first time in a while. Recently, my grandmother passed away upstairs in what's now my parents' bedroom. My grandfather also passed away in this house in the hallway going to the garage. Every paranormal experience we've had, we know that it was one of my grandparents, since it was never malvoyant and we never felt nervous or scared. I'm not saying the spirit I saw was malvoyant. I do believe that it was my grandma, but it still did freak me out, and I did cry. It's only been a month and a half without her, so it's nice to know she's still around. But it was awful timing, Grandma. I'm now sleeping upstairs until my parents finish the wall. Good spirit or not, it's still nerve-wracking to have a paranormal experience. So I've been sitting on this story for three years, telling some close friends who respond with astonished looks and advise on mental health and think I'm completely insane. It's 11.17 in rural New Brunswick, Canada, and I'm getting in my car to head back to Fredericton from my parents' place in the middle of nowhere. I had just finished up a small gig at a local fair, having had one or two beers at the show. I'm just pulling out of my parents' driveway onto a dim country road going back to the city when I turn on my high beams to see a tall, lanky, completely black figure standing in the ditch on the right side of the road. I mean, this thing must have been eight or nine feet tall. It absorbed all light and had limbs no bigger around than a baguette. As soon as I saw it, it started to run up the ditch and across the road in a very fast, very strange, gliding kind of way. I slammed on the brakes and watched this thing run across the road and into a field on the other side of the road towards some woods. I'm getting goosebumps writing this, but I could still see its silhouette speeding across the field in my neighbor's yard as it went into the black of the night. I stopped for a moment, shivering, before speeding up the road to a safe distance. I had no idea what I had just seen, so I called my mom to tell her that I had just witnessed this tall, alien-looking creature less than a hundred meters from our home. She and my sister searched online with what I had told them, and came back with an article on the Black Stick Man phenomena, which fit exactly what I had seen on this normal August night in New Brunswick. This experience has really opened my mind to the paranormal, so for that I'm almost thankful. I was looking over my shoulder for a few weeks, afraid to go out at night, and I still feel unnerved when thinking about it. I haven't seen anything like it since, but have had some experiences with spirits growing up in what my whole family agrees is a haunted house. I was reading somebody's Reddit post today where they talked about their mother being scared because she heard three knocks and related it to the three knock omen, which I had never heard of. I decided to do some research on it, and apparently there's a superstition around hearing three knocks because it's supposedly followed by a death in the family or someone that's close to you. That has happened to me. A couple years ago, I went to a mountain resort in California for a little over a month and stayed with my sister and brother-in-law who lived there. Around the same time when I came, they got a new roommate. He was a nice guy, maybe in his late 20s, early 30s, an ex-alcoholic, but overall, just a really great guy. I spent a lot of my summer going on hikes and playing video games with him and my brother-in-law, and I would say that I got to know him pretty well, but not as well as my sister and her husband did. The roommate, Jack, 
had lost a close friend a year or so before when he got drunk and decided to fall asleep outside in the middle of a snowstorm, which apparently happens more often than you would think. Since then, Jack had never so much as touched a beer, and he was quite proud of it. Anyways, it was around my third or fourth week there, when my sister and I were watching The Baba Duke, and it was pretty late at night, around 1, maybe 2 a.m. The movie ended, and she was going to let me sleep in the room with her since Jack and her husband were out camping or something, but I don't really remember what they were doing. It was silent in the house, and all the lights were off when we heard three loud, distinct knocking sounds. I asked her if she had heard them, and she said yes, but it was probably just the dryer making noises upstairs. It was a fairly new dryer that didn't make any sound. Maybe around ten minutes later we heard the same three knocks again, but my sister rode it off to the dryer being noisy once more. It didn't sound like a broken dryer, since it was three obvious knocks, though. I don't want to go too far into the history of the house or anything, but it was definitely haunted. Things would randomly fly off of shelves, and the lights would randomly turn themselves off. Also, some of the furniture that the house came with had what we thought were blood stains. I wrote that night off to the spirit in their house messing with us since we were watching a scary movie, up until today, when I put everything together. Two days after I left, they found Jack dead in his room, upstairs. They said he drank himself to death, which was surprising considering how proud he was of getting sober. Maybe the death knocks were real, or maybe not. Maybe it was all just a coincidence. What do you think? Also, I should probably also mention that he had a bad liver from his previous drinking problem. I don't really know how that works, but I guess one night of extremely heavy drinking did it for him. I didn't push for more information about his death since it really shook my sister up. All she said was that he drank himself to death. Disclaimer. In no way am I saying that death knocks are 100% real or that if you hear them, a family member or friend will definitely drop dead. As for the furniture that we thought had blood on it, it might not have been blood. Maybe it was just an odd colored stain from where something had been spilled. I'm not saying that I'm sure that Jack's death was related to anything that happened in the house. I just made the connection and found it fascinating. Although I've had several paranormal experiences in my life, I was always a skeptic. I tried to debunk my own experiences, like, what if I was just tired? There must be a logical explanation. However, this experience made me a believer. A few years ago, I visited my friend who lives abroad. We decided to go inside an old amusement park that had been abandoned years ago. As a kid, my friend had visited the place every week, so it was pure nostalgia for her. We snuck through a hole in the fence and entered the park. The place was taken back by nature, mostly overgrown and with small, swampy little puddles everywhere. We were nervous about snakes hiding in the grass, and about the big pack of feral dogs roaming the property. But the paranormal hadn't crossed our minds. Upon entering the park, the dogs barked at us, warning us to leave them alone so we avoided the area where they were and went on exploring. We seemed to be the only people there. After a good 30 minutes or so, we stumbled upon an empty karaoke bar. The place felt off somehow, not like the other buildings we encountered. My friend explains that this building is not what it seems. Karaoke bars in her country are often a cover for alcohol consumption, which was illegal back then, and prostitution. She doesn't recognize the place, which is weird since she spent a big part of her childhood at the park. We figured that it must have been a bit hidden away from the crowds, since it was most likely linked to illegal activity. 
The moment that we entered the building, my attention was immediately drawn toward a creepy door with a broken glass panel. You could see that there was nothing on the other side, but somehow the darkness behind the door seemed more solid than the door itself. I stared at it for at least a good 15 seconds before I tell myself to stop freaking out about a door. While we explore the first floor, I hear footsteps right behind me. Thinking it was my friend, I turn around, ready to make a stupid joke about her creeping up on me. But she isn't there. I see her at the other end of the room, at least eight meters away from me. I chalk it up to weird acoustics and don't tell her about it. Do you know that feeling you get when people are staring at you? That's how the second floor felt. It was as if we had walked into a crowded room, except that no one was there. Like on the first floor, the darkness of some unlit areas somehow seemed too dark. More solid. I became increasingly nervous, but I didn't tell my friend, since I didn't want to sound crazy. Soon, my friend stopped in her tracks, and said that she wasn't comfortable exploring any further. She later described that room as a quote-unquote black hole. She recalls feeling as if all her movements were slower than normal, and as if her brain were foggy. This was right above the door that freaked me out so much. Back on the first floor, we feel silly for even being that nervous, and we try to overcome our fears. I decide to open a door adjacent to the freaky door, which was easier said than done. The door was stuck, and I had to put my weight behind it to get it to open. We caught a glimpse of a small storage room before the door was slammed shut again. We almost made a run for it, but since we stubbornly didn't want to give in to our fears and be wusses, we took a few more pictures of the room before we left. Once outside, we rationalized it by saying that it must have been some sort of animal, a stray dog maybe, but we were not convinced. Opening the door took some strength, so what animal could have closed it with such force? There was barely any space between the open door and the wall, so I doubt that it could have been a person hiding there. We talk for a bit to lighten the mood, and we feel braver now that we're outside again. We decide to visit her favorite attraction next, the pirate ship. In the past, it would swing back and forth, but now we couldn't get it to move no matter how much we tried. We both pushed against it with our full body weight, but the ship just wouldn't budge. We take a few photos while we chat about my friend's memories of the park. All of a sudden, the pirate ship begins to move. Slow at first, so slow that I thought that I had imagined it, but then it started to swing more clearly. Since we don't feel the creepy vibes that we felt at the karaoke bar, we decide to stay and watch. After a few minutes, my friend remarks that we should head back soon, since she wouldn't want to be in this place after dark. Immediately after those words left her mouth, it got darker, as if it were suddenly twilight. Remember the dogs who barked when we entered the park? They had been quiet since they realized that we were not a threat. But now, they go wild, barking and howling in the distance. My friend and I don't hesitate and make a run for it. We run through the dark, overgrown park while the dogs go crazy. It was surreal. Once we reach to the hole in the fence, we crawl out as fast as we can and suddenly, we feel safe again. I swear, once outside, the sun was shining bright. We looked up to see if it was just a well-timed cloud that had moved in front of the sun, but we couldn't see anything. To this day, my friend is convinced that something told us to leave, since it got dark right after we decided to go home once it was getting dark. I don't believe in these kinds of theories, but feeling-wise, it genuinely felt as if we had went through some sort of gateway when we entered that area. As if it was its own little world. The contrast was just that big. Back home, we talked about our experiences. Apparently, we both felt uneasy in the karaoke bar long before we actually voiced those feelings. I told her about the creepy vibe I got from the door, and showed her a picture that I took of it when we first entered the building. She tells me she felt the same thing, and took a picture just before we left. Upon comparison, we realized that the door is cracked open a little bit in my photo, but in hers, it's half open. These photos were taken five minutes apart, and it seems very unlikely that someone snuck in to open it while we were on the second floor. 
The dog pack was in a different area of the park, and there was no wind that day. I don't have an explanation, but given our other experiences at the park, this creeped me out even more. Like I said, I have experienced strange things in the past, but nothing like this. In the hour that we spent at that park, I went from a skeptic to a believer. I would love to go back someday and see what happens. This happened when I was around 10, in a house where the second floor was still under construction. My mom and grandma had a major disagreement back when we were living in Toronto, and my grandma decided to move to her home country, Ecuador. Soon after, due to complications, my mom decided to give in and follow her. We moved in with my grandma, but since the house was a little small for four people, and since my great-grandmother was soon to be moving in as well, my family decided to extend a floor. For the meantime, my great-grandma was staying in a room extension with her own bathroom because she would have accidents frequently. The room was an extension outside, close to the main door. My great-grandma was really old, but still cognitive enough to have fun conversations with, so I would spend a lot of time talking with her outside. She started telling me about this little green guy that would visit her at night, and he would just sit on the TV and watch her. In South America, we grew up talking about duendes, leprechauns that would mess with people wandering around strange areas at night. It's kind of our folklore, like the chupacabras or skinwalkers. But since my grandma was getting old, my mom would just brush it off and blame it on her aging or her mental health. One night, my family went to a dinner party, but since I had a best friend over, I insisted on staying home. It was getting really late, but we were waiting for one of our favorite shows to air on Cartoon Network. My family is very religious and hated these quote-unquote demonic cartoons, so we tried to watch quietly. I was under the impression that my great-grandma was resting in one of the rooms behind us, in my mom's room, because I kept hearing noises coming from down the hall. Suddenly, I hear my grandma's walker clicking its way out of the room, so I quickly turned off the TV and told my friend to be quiet. We hid under the blankets and waited until my grandma went back to the room. She used to walk with one of those four-legged walkers and would take her time as she moved. We thought she was just going to use the washroom, so we decided to wait it out. Her walking seemed very quiet though, which was odd, but I didn't think much of it. She went to the washroom, but didn't open up the toilet lid. There was no noise, no peeing or anything, and the weirdest part? No word or call to see if we were sleeping or still up. We just heard the walking go straight back to the room quietly. Then suddenly I remembered that the dinner my family went to was meant to celebrate her. She wasn't home, and we were supposed to be alone. As soon as I realized that, we heard small footsteps sprinting from one room to the other, and then a glass breaking. We were petrified. We didn't know what was behind us, if it was someone that broke in or an animal, but we were too afraid to look. We stayed under the sheets until my family came back home. Fortunately, they arrived only moments after. As soon as my stepdad came in, we told him what happened. He brought my dog upstairs where the second floor was being built, as he was thinking that it would have been an animal that came in since the staircase was only being covered by a plastic sheet. My mom goes into my grandma's room and finds a glass jug on the floor with a broken handle. The jug was supposed to be in my room. Something had to have carried the jug and dropped it in there. My dog was also barking throughout the night, which was pretty common, but when he came in the house, he seemed really anxious to sprint upstairs, as if he knew something was there. My best friend and I have been through a couple of weird things back home, but nothing as vivid as this. Again, it could have been an animal, but that doesn't explain the metal walker noise that we heard. It could have been an intruder, but we would have definitely seen someone come through the plastic covering the stairwell. 
He could have been the little green guy my great-grandma talked about. A lot of times, little shadows would rush through my peripherals, but I always thought it was just my imagination. She passed away only a couple months after this. But weird small footsteps and random dog chases never stopped. The footsteps I would hear didn't sound like small critters, since animals tend to bolt from place to place. The steps I remember hearing as a kid seemed much more meticulous and slow. And always late at night. This past weekend, my boyfriend came over and we were hanging out downstairs. I soon got tired, so I ended up going upstairs to my bedroom. I immediately felt a presence following me as I walked up the stairs. It felt as if it were following behind me, and there was something breathing on my neck. The feeling when you know that something is there. Me being scared, I refused to look back. I just plop into bed and face the wall, hoping that nothing happens. I still feel like there's something there, but this time it feels like someone is just watching me sleep. Then it starts to get hot. Even though I was scared, I turn to open the window, and there is a holographic type of ghost hovering over my bed. I turn around again, not getting up. I lay there facing my wall, so uncomfortable for a minute or two. I quickly get the courage to open the window and go lay back in bed. But before I get there, my LED TV starts flashing and changing the color mode. Mind, these lights only turn on when the TV is on because they're connected to my TV's USB, and I was unable to turn them on myself when the TV was off. I quickly grab the remote and turn it off. Then, all of a sudden, the empty Starbucks cup sitting on my nightstand table falls off in a weird way, as in it looks as if it were being pushed. I turned on my bedroom light, grabbed my phone, and yeeted out of there. I was so terrified. So I had to shut it off so that I could live a normal life again without seeing them. But my cousin, who has no abilities, has seen them in the house. At first when he moved in, he didn't know that it was haunted. I didn't want to tell him that the house was haunted because I thought, well, maybe it's not. And if I told him, he would believe it was, and that would influence him in some way. If it was haunted, I was going to let him find out on his own. Or if it didn't bother him, then I would let it be. As the weeks passed and things moved in front of our eyes, he started to hear his family members' voices calling his name from time to time in the middle of the night. It was the same experience that I had had. He would have a nightmare sometimes of something trying to come inside of the room, yet it was stuck on the other side of the door, unable to get in. It was beckoning him to let it inside, to open the door. It's odd because I actually have a video of it doing that, and it's heard in the video faintly. When I lived alone, it would occur very frequently, but instead of in dreams, it was literally in real life and happening on camera. I did not show him the video beforehand, so there's no way he could have known. Eventually, I did open up to him about it being haunted, but that it's not really a big deal or anything since my family ends up in the haunted house usually for some odd reason. I explained that if we made excuses and such, that the activity would remain low. For instance, if something slides across the floor in front of us, we just pass it off as something else, no matter how stupid that that excuse or rationalization is, and we say it out loud, shrug it off, and move on. Sometimes if it happens again after that, we just make another excuse, and then it stops. If something pounds on our walls from all directions, which only usually happens for a few seconds, we just ignore it and make another excuse, and then life goes on as normal. My cousin would be laying in bed at night, and he explained that he would see this almost rippling kind of apparition. 
I thought it must be an eyesight issue, so I asked him to show me where it was. Weirdly enough, it was the same wall that I had had a nightmare about months ago involving things trying to climb out of a black tar-like door with nearly a hundred arms covered in the tar-like goo. So yeah, it was weird, and he didn't have that experience again. Anyway, in the room one day when I was living there on my own, I had seen a woman. Pretty much the generic, typical ghost. Most of them don't seem to look like that in real life, but in movies they do. Just a young woman who floated through my bedroom door and then through the wall beside it. Nearly entirely see-through, and from the waist down, she looked as if she were made of mist or fog. No color at all, and also in a very old, almost wedding gown type of dress. Also in the room, I would often see glowing white, circular orb-like things that would float and then leave. Almost like a flicker, but I thought it was just, I don't know, a headache or whatever. But it was always in one spot of the room. Well, my cousin saw it too. Again, in the exact same spot that I would usually see it in. And then I told him that it happens sometimes. He's gotten used to the house, and most of the activity stopped happening after I shut it off. I also bought a little spirit box and would use it outside whenever the activity would go up. Soon after, I went back inside. Life was back to normal and the activity would subside for another month or two. Before the spirit box, the activity was nearly unlivable. Dangerous, almost. Now it's extremely silent. Like we have an actual home now. If anything, I mean it's just a house that happens to be haunted, but a house nonetheless. With all of the haunted houses my family and I have lived in, my only advice is to never let a haunting consume you. My mom had always told me that I was gifted. I could always feel energies. I had dreams of things that would come to happen. I wouldn't say I'm a medium or anything like that. I've never communicated with spirits. More so, I'd say I attract them. We hopped apartments a lot when I was younger, and no matter where we went, an entity would immediately find me. I'd have recurring nightmares, see figures, be scratched, etc. You could say spirits like to pick on me. Another random fact that will come into play later. I had bright blue eyes, like my mother. We moved into this apartment, and things immediately went very, very poorly. I had a dream that only lasted seconds. I was in a bright white room. And there was this beast on the ceiling, and it looked into my eyes and roared. It was so incredibly loud. I woke up, and my mom and her boyfriend at the time had rushed to my aid because they heard me let out a scream that sounded like a deep, full-grown man's scream, not a prepubescent boy's. My eyes turned hazel with brown splotches, and have been that way ever since. I was terrified. We moved me into my big brother's room. That night, I felt a presence, opened my eyes, and I saw a shadowy figure reach out and try to grab me. I sprinted out of the room and slept next to my mom or on the couch in the living room from then on, but I always felt watched from the hallway leading to my bedroom. Another thing that happened was when I was laying in bed with my mom and her boyfriend, she looked up and saw a little girl in a petticoat standing in the hallway. He saw it too. I was asleep and only knew this because they told me years later. Anyhow, everyone was being terrorized for months, and eventually we had enough. We hired someone to come in and she immediately detected a demonic presence. She had informed us that the building used to be a medical waste facility. They'd dispose of and store blood in the basement. That sort of thing. My mom has told me since that she was able to confirm this detail, but to be truthful, I never asked how. Thinking about and speaking about this incident brings me terrible feelings. 
Anyhow, she blessed the place, and it didn't really do anything. We tried writing scripture on the walls and this sort of highlighter stuff that you could only see in UV light. We put up some crosses, that sort of thing. It only served to make whatever it was angrier. We eventually moved out, and my mom spoke clearly as we left. We're leaving. You are not allowed to follow us. I've never had another experience with a spirit. A friend of mine who says that she is a medium, I'm not sure what I believe about this sort of thing, told me that maybe God, maybe a spirit, maybe myself, walled myself off spiritually from my gift. I think that maybe it was the same spirit tormenting me my entire life up until that point. When I think about this, tears immediately begin pouring from my eyes. I'm 20 now, and this was easily one of the most turbulent times of my life. This is a true story. When I was in high school, I had a friend who lived near our house. We would always walk from school to our homes. We were pretty close, and we talked about anything. One time, when we were walking along the road, she suddenly spoke and said that she smelled candles. It was a busy street, and it was only around 4 p.m., I think. I replied, it must be from the truck. I said this because one had just driven past us when she said that. She had a serious face, which was unusual because she was more talkative between the two of us. She insisted that she could still smell it as we continued walking, but stopped after a while. Fast forward to the next day. It was Saturday and I had just woken up. I literally got goosebumps. I felt so shocked when I read her text. It said that her father had died. Do you also believe in superstitions? Here in our country, a smell of flower or candle indicates the death of a person. One early summer morning in 2000, I got up and ready to drive my mom to her job at a local retirement home. It was dark starting out, but the sun was gradually coming up. I dropped her off and started returning to her house. Halfway back, driving on a country road densely populated with trees and houses, I noticed a car coming because I could see its high beaming lights from a short distance. I also saw a large, jet-black dog in my path, standing completely still with its head pointed forward. It had a slender build. Having only a few seconds to think, I decided to continue forward and brace for the impact from running into its body. I closed my eyes as I got the closest to it, and continued to drive without swerving, and to my surprise, I felt nothing. I slowed down to check for the dog, but there was absolutely nothing back there. As I continued my drive, I felt strange because there was no way that I would have missed that animal. It was not facing me. It was facing right. I would have struck it broadside. Anyway, I'm thankful I didn't swerve. I feel like had I swerved, things would have been very much different for me today. I do believe that I could have died. My family lives near a very large conference center in northeast Georgia. Due to COVID-19, the conference center has been shuttered and abandoned since May. This is a sprawling property with over 900 acres of forest, lake, and wilderness with a few large hotels and a dining room, auditorium, etc. It's been around for about 50 to 60 years, although my family has only been in the area since the 90s. My girlfriend and I decided to explore the property, since it's been abandoned for months now. 
The entrance is very securely gated. There's no way to get past the front gates without a bulldozer, so we walked through the woods, leaving the car at the top. We walked through the parking lots to make sure that no one else was there. The location is very remote, so it would be extremely unlikely that anyone would visit on foot, especially in the middle of the night on Thanksgiving. We got access through an upper exterior door, and we started poking around the main hotel. It was completely abandoned, but left in good condition. It was spooky, as the only lighting came from the red glow of the emergency exit signs. We looked in many of the other rooms, and everything seemed neat and orderly, like guests could check in at any moment. We reached the main lobby, and then we both heard it. And froze. We simultaneously heard what sounded like a music box playing deep within one of the halls. Neither of us believe in the paranormal, but we both froze dead in our tracks and looked at each other, our faces confirming that we were both terrified. We bolted as fast as we could through the upper door, making sure that it closed securely behind us, and fled on foot. The music 100% sounded like it was coming from a music box, but it was also vaguely metallic, almost like it was a different frequency than most music. Due to the way that it sounded, we ruled out that it could be a forgotten cell phone or a computer. This was not any type of alert or notification made by an electronic device. There's also no cell phone service out there. Usually, I can find a logical explanation for paranormal phenomena, as I'm admittedly skeptical about it. However, I cannot figure out for the life of me what that music could have been. There was no one else on the property. There were absolutely no signs of squatters, and there's no music boxes in the hotel rooms. They are all intentionally identical, so there would have been one in every room. Does anyone have any insight on this? We were genuinely terrified, but now I'm regretting not investigating further. I was wondering if anyone could offer their thoughts, or an explanation on a paranormal experience that I had as a child. When I was eleven, my younger sister passed away from a very sudden death. Months before this incident, I had a vision in the middle of the night that I had never made sense of until recently. I had woken up and saw a floating orb of white light in my room. Inside of it was a young child, around four, maybe five years old, the same age as my late sister, with short hair wearing a Victorian-style nightgown. I came close to it and stared at it for a minute or two, and then went back to sleep. The next day, I was filled with overwhelming anxiety and the feeling of someone's presence in the house. Only years after this vision and the death of my sister have I thought that this could possibly be some sort of omen or warning of her death. I was sleeping the other night, and I remember waking up, or rather, so it seemed, yet it still felt like I was dreaming. I was lying in bed, and remember sitting up and seeing three figures standing in my room with a dimly lit blue light coming from somewhere that illuminated them. I don't remember exactly what they said, or rather he said, cause the one in the middle was speaking directly to me. I remember his mouth opening in a very inhuman way with the jaw extending further than it should be able to. Their mouth and eyes were black. Not like solid black, but a smoky type of black, so sort of gray, but you could still recognize teeth and such. I remember them saying something about them coming in a few days, but I don't remember what it was exactly. I then remember passing back out and waking up, actually waking up, and seeing some dark form dart across the room and hover directly over my bed. My bed is in a corner, so it was sitting or hovering between the wall and I, with about a four-inch gap at the top at the time. 
I then felt a very, very intense sensation of dread and heaviness throughout my entire fiber and being, and recall feeling this for a few minutes while it was just sitting there with my back turned to it. Then, out of nowhere, a sense of euphoria and great peace came over me. No longer did I fear or dread anything, but rather, I felt happy, at peace, loved. I don't really know how to describe it. I remember that thing, whatever it was, was no longer there. I'm not religious, but I am spiritual in the sense of believing and following my own route when it comes to what happens after human death. I believe in a very unique form of reincarnation, in which the soul, essence, energy, consciousness, whatever you want to refer to it as, travels until it finds a new place to call home, and it could span across the entire universe. That being said, I couldn't help but feel like there was actually an evil presence there with me in my room, and a guardian angel, or some other known source of good energy, cast it out. When I was three years old and living with my mom at the time, we bounced around a lot from house to house. We ended up moving into a house that was just a few blocks away from my dad. I just want to state that these are my very first memories. I don't remember anything before this house. That's how traumatic that it was for me. But I'll do my best to explain these experiences in an adult version because I was three at the time and still hadn't learned to talk very well. So we move in, and I don't remember anything out of the ordinary happening right away, but soon I would start seeing this red man, or bad man, or fireman. My mom told me that's always what I would call him, because I have very little memory of what I would call this thing. I vividly remember it wanting to hurt me. I don't know how I knew, but I knew that I wasn't safe every time I saw him. Sometimes he would chase me down the halls or come through the walls, and I would run to my mom trying to explain what was happening. My mom said that I would run up to her crying and shaking, saying that the bad man was trying to hurt me. This thing kept going on, and eventually something else started happening. Every time this red man would try and hurt me, this new entity would show up. I say entity because I couldn't tell its gender, and I don't remember it having a face, but it was like it was a glowing ball of light that would chase away the bad man every time he was around. This went on for months before I finally moved in with my dad. Because I was so scared constantly, I actually developed a stutter and my whole body would tremble. One day while living at my dad's, I was drawing and my mom asked if I could draw what I was seeing. I was drawing in a coloring book, and one page had an angel on it, and I started drawing circles around it because I couldn't actually see what it was. In my mind, it was just a big ball of white energy. I'm not Christian and don't believe in angels or demons, but I do believe in negative energies and positive ones that could maybe manifest into ghosts or spirits. So at this point, I had permanently moved in with my dad. I went to speech therapy for a long time to fix the stutter, and now, even to this day, my hands shake. Apparently, it's called trauma tremors. After moving in with my dad, my mom and brother, who had never seen anything weird like I did, just saw my reactions to it. Both started experiencing things. Not as bad as what had happened to me, but still creepy as hell. My mom would start to hear the piano play, and my uncle play the piano, so she thought that it was him playing it, until she walked over there and realized that no one was in the room. My brother would see shadows and lights turn off by themselves, but that's all that really happened to them. My mom eventually moved out of that house because too many things were going on and she really was getting creeped out. Me and her moved into a trailer, and the first night there, I was laying in bed with her, and I was apparently staring into the bathroom. I don't remember this, but my mom does. And she asked what I was staring at, and I said, there's a man standing in the bathtub. And she then asked, is he a good man or a bad man? I said, a good man, and went to sleep right after. We later found out that the owner of the trailer before us was an old man 
who had died. Ever since then, I've never seen any paranormal things, but I can still sense if houses have good or negative energies. Believe the story or not, but it was very real to me and has permanently given me a tremor. When I was older, probably around seven, and could fluently speak, my family asked me if I remembered what had happened at the house. I guess they thought that I forgot or had made it up. And I told them the story in astounding detail, and it freaked everyone. Me and my mom occasionally talk about this from time to time because we still don't know what had happened. We just know it did, and that it was messed up. This story took place in the mid-2000s in Malaysia, when the Nokia 3310 was still a thing and teenage idiocracy was the ruling personality. I was only 14 at the time, and while introverted, I had a group of friends who were mostly in their late teens and early 20s. While this may seem unusual, it is somewhat common for Malaysian teens to have friends with considerable age gaps. One day, this group of friends decided to visit some abandoned flats and condos from a failed development project. The reason? They wanted to try their hand at ghost hunting. Not wanting to be called a coward, I naturally took up on their little excursion. It was planned that we would visit these supposedly haunted buildings on a Thursday night. The night rolls around and there we were, 20 people, including myself, arriving at the abandoned flat. The flat, darkened by grime with windows missing, presumably detached by junkies to be sold for some small change, loomed over them. Group by group, we entered, flashlights drawn. As I recalled, it was around 10 p.m. Slowly, we made our way up the floors, exploring each unit, calling out to whatever might be residing there. The men's group had splintered into their respective groups, their hushed conversations, callings, and the occasional bouts of snickering and laughter echoing throughout the apartments. I stayed close to my group, not taking the chance of losing sight of them for even a second. For about two hours, we were exploring, calling out to whatever ghosts or spirits we believed were making this flat their home, but we received no reply. At this point, we were tired, bored, but most importantly, hungry. After a couple of calls between the heads of each group, it was decided that we would end the night and go have something to eat. So off we went, a small convoy of cars to the nearest restaurant. As we arrived and settled in again in our own little groups, we ordered our drinks and food and started shooting the breeze. The topic about the abandoned flat was initially on the table, but was quickly dismissed since we never found anything interesting or experienced anything ghost-related at the location. That is, until one of the restaurant servers marched up to our table. His face was stern, and he was pointing at the younger kid who was sitting quietly minding his own business, and he asked, Who are you? No reply. Again he asked in a louder, more demanding tone. At this sudden outburst of questioning, we were all stunned, and had our focus to this server and that kid who was still keeping quiet with his expression blank. The server turned to all of us and asked, Where were you just now? Where did you drive from? A guy from my table told him that we had just left that location. The server looked at us, and still with his eyes on us, pointed to the kid he was questioning, and asked all of us, Do any of you recognize this kid? Nineteen pairs of eyes shifted toward the quiet kid, and it hit all of us at once. None of us knew him. We made a head count and totaled twenty heads, including this kid. My group leader asked the kid's group leader if he recognized him, but he said no. But you drove him here, right? You were with him, right? They were asking. Yeah, he said, but I don't know this kid. At that, the server turned to the ashen-faced group leader and told him that his friend was still at the flat. He said, you go return this thing and you find your friend. Only you and your group. The others cannot come unless you want someone else to be switched. We shifted in our seats, and after what felt like an eternity, the guys at that kid's table got up, went to their car, with the kid following them without asking or invitation. 
even after food and drinks arrived for the remaining men. Any appetite that we had before had dissipated. The rest of the story was told to me by my friend who heard it from the group leader with the quiet kid. When they returned to the flats, they swept through each floor, every unit, and every room looking for the missing kid. The thing that switched places with the kid? The entire group dare not look its way as it tailed behind them while they searched. They felt its presence as they climbed the floors, sensing it growing more and more incensed as they neared the top. It took them about an hour before they found who they were looking for, passed out in a room on one of the upper levels. When they found him, they felt the malicious anger of the presence vanish, and then they mustered the courage to look over their shoulder. The kid was gone. They didn't hesitate in getting themselves out, not even bothering to fully awake the passed out kid and ask about his condition. One of the bigger guys grabbed him and they all ran, each of them praying to whatever they believe in to protect themselves from whatever resided in that abandoned flat. They got to the car, practically throwing the kid they found in the back seat, and after the engine sputtered to life, the driver buried his foot into the gas pedal and they sped away. As I recall all of this, I remembered a conversation that I had with one of my Malay friends who is a little serious on matters of the occult. His stance when it comes to them? We don't disturb them, they don't disturb us. So don't go snooping around in their territories. This happened to me a few months ago. I woke up in the middle of the night. I was on my back, and there was a man standing at the foot of my bed, staring at me. He was wearing black. He looked very calm. I think he was floating, because he was high up in the air. I have always been freaked out about ghosts. But for some reason, I did not panic, and I just stared back at him for a few seconds. After he seemed to realize that I was awake, he was surprised and appeared nervous. He then turned away as if he was leaving and disappeared. I never had any experiences with sleep paralysis, so I don't think that this was the reason that this happened. Also, my dog was sleeping next to me and she did not wake up. Even after he left, I was not afraid. I truly do not understand why. Last night, I woke up from a vision where my boyfriend bit me right between the shoulder blades. I turned to look at him, but he was deep asleep. The next morning, he told me that he saw a dream where I bit him between his shoulder blades. We were weirded out by this. There was no bite mark on his back, but it hurt like a bitch by his words. The day starts going by and I notice him acting strangely. I've been working mostly with spirits before, and we live in a very old building with an interesting history, but this was new. He said he can't control his own body, that there is someone else with him. I started to get my stuff to banish whatever there was. I kept talking to him while gathering my things. He wasn't acting like himself anymore. He was very rude, but in a charming way while eating grapes on our bed. I banished the thing, still unsure of what it was. The rest of the day has been normal, and I haven't felt any bad energies, but my boyfriend keeps telling me that the bite between his shoulder blades keeps hurting. Does anyone have any idea? what I am dealing with here. This is a story that happened to me when I was just a fresh graduate, starting my first job at a temp agency. It was 2002, and my job was located in the middle of nowhere and very far from my home. 
Therefore, I took the effort of doing most of my job in the office till late at night, since I do not wish to come home and continue with work. Rather, that would give me some rest for the remainder of the night. I usually stayed up even later on Fridays, knowing that if I finished the work fully, the weekends would be golden for me. So, this story occurred on one of those Fridays when everyone else had already left. After making my prayers for the night, I continued with my work. There was no one I believed that was in the office, but I felt a presence. Perhaps it was another co-worker working late just like me. I took that belief to heart. At one point in time, around 11 I believe, I needed to go to the toilet, which was located at the end of a long, dark hallway lighted only by the green exit sign. I found that the toilet was locked, so I looked to the toilet that is on the next level. I took the staircase, which was lighted by a circular wall lamp, and found that the toilet was unlocked. Thankfully, I did my business and returned back to work. The next part of the story comes in a rather weird way. As I made my way back, passing by the locked toilet, I saw the shadow of someone by the office door beaming from the front light that I had left on. My guess is that either the co-worker was about to leave or that she was taking coffee for the night since the pantry is near the entrance. When I got there, there was no one by the pantry or the entrance, so again I went back to my desk. I was trying to finish up that last bit of work when I started to peek through the gap between each desk, trying to see the other person who was working late at night, but somehow, no matter what, I was unable to spot him or her. When I got finished up about 15 minutes later, I decided to get myself a drink from the pantry. Then, the lights went off. Just as I took the can of juice from the fridge, I turned to find myself in total darkness. There was a voice calling out to me, trying to reach me, and I tried to find it. The voice was unclear at the beginning, but soon it became what I think the person was saying, Help me. The sound was the strongest by the window which was facing the main road that was now deserted. I looked about in the darkness, seeing if there was anyone in distress, and as I did so, I felt a hand touching my shoulder. I turned around, and no one was there. At this point already, I knew that I needed to get the hell out, and so I went to my desk and started packing. Then it came. It came from outside, falling with a piercing scream and with a clear face. The face of a bloody woman. I quickly rushed to the window, opened it up, and looked at the ground, but there was no one. I made my way to the ground floor and to the main road, clutching my laptop and backpack as I tried to search for a cab, but it felt like nearly hours, despite it only being minutes before one came by. What kept me at the edge was the fact that I felt like a thousand boots were marching toward me, shouting in Japanese commands. I kept my eyes on the road, but occasionally I turned back to see my office building. On the last turn, I saw a bunch of uniformed men with rifles, gray faces bayoneting a bloody woman, stepping on her body, throwing what I believe to be her baby in the air and killing it as it landed on the ground. I couldn't take it anymore. I ran from the scene. I do believe in the paranormal. Not routinely and not as an explanation for everything, but I definitely believe that some things just can't be logically explained. I've dabbled in divination for the past couple years, which has led me to notice more universal symbolism and omens. Recently, I've seen some weird ones. I was driving around my area the other day, and passed a funeral procession twice. It struck me as sort of unsettling and out of the ordinary. I drive around a lot, and I don't usually see funeral processions around just randomly. I was a little bit anxious by it, especially so when I passed the hearse itself, but I pretty much brushed it off. That same day, I was pulling into a drive through at around 3 a.m., and a black cat came out of seemingly nowhere. It strolled in front of the car and continued walking into nothing. 
It felt very rare to see, since I live in a well-populated suburb that doesn't usually have animals roaming about. This morning, there was a black cat watching my window on the windowsill of the house across from mine. As I looked at the cat, it began to thunderstorm. I know it all sounds really small and maybe a touch overzealous, but I couldn't help but feeling odd about these things because of how out of the ordinary that they felt and silently spooky. Not to mention, all happening in the same couple of days. The closeness of it all made me curious, and I had to look into it, just to see if these things were things that other people believed to be bad omens. In my very unofficial research, I have found that, one, passing a funeral can be bad luck and can, quote-unquote, hasten your own death. Two, in European folklore, a black cat crossing your path can be unlucky and lead to misfortune and death. Occasionally, however, they can represent good luck, but from what I've found, it's fairly situational. And three, in Greek mythology, thunder could represent punishment to the humans by the gods, associated with Zeus. Clearly, death is kind of a theme here. All of this just doesn't sit well with me, and it's accompanied by a generally strange feeling that I've noticed prevailing in my mood lately. Something just feels off, you know? Since childhood, I've had my fair share of paranormal experiences, especially while sleeping. I've had one particular entity visit me in my dream for one year when I was in a different house. Never seen that entity again once I moved, even though I lived in the same area. Just a lot of weird stuff like this. But last night, I had the weirdest experience of my life. I was sleeping in bed with my wife, and I dreamt that my wife kissed me and went under the blanket. I woke up and sat on the bed with my lower body covered with a blanket. I checked on my wife, but she wasn't in the bed. That was so strange. So if my wife was not in the bed, then who kissed me? While I'm thinking about this, realizing that my wife was outside in the living room, something started moving under the covers. It was like a snake or a tentacle that started wrapping around my legs. I kid you not, I was freaked out and at the same time I was very calm because everything was smooth and non-aggressive. It felt like something were cuddling my legs. I slapped myself to make sure that I was awake and I was, white as day. Holy smokes, I thought, this thing is moving and cuddling in the sheets and it was bloody real. As the thing moved from my thighs to my shins, I literally saw the blankets move with it. Then I freaked out a little more, but not enough to stop it. I couldn't help myself, I was still curious. I kept sitting on my bed while the thing moved to my shin. I felt it wrap around both my legs and just stay in that position, like a ghost hug. I moved my foot up and down, just to check to see if this was anything like sleep paralysis, but it wasn't. My foot was fine, everything was moving, I was moving, that thing was moving, and I was wide awake. But now it was getting really freaky, and I had to get out of it. I slowly pulled the blanket off, and whatever that was, I couldn't see. It slowly unwrapped and went away. I got up and went to my wife, told her the story, and we came back to bed. We woke up the next morning, and here I am, still freaked out, hoping that it was an act of love by whatever, and nothing more. When I was 16 years old, I'm female by the way, my friends and I decided that it would be fun to go out to an old abandoned farmhouse that was rumored to be haunted. We didn't really believe in ghosts at the time, but were fascinated by the thrill of potentially experiencing something paranormal. 
So on a hot summer night in July, we decided to take two cars out to this abandoned place. There were six of us in total. It took about 45 minutes to drive there, so we left around 2.15 a.m. because we wanted to arrive at the farmhouse by 3 a.m. Witching hour. To get to the house, we drove down a dark, winding country road with houses few and far between. There were no street lights, so although it was a warm summer night, it felt incredibly scary as we drove through the unfamiliar place in the pitch black. As we arrived at the house, I nearly felt sick to my stomach. I didn't believe in ghosts or the paranormal at the time, like I said, but something in my gut just felt wrong. The house was situated at the bottom of two hills, and there was no driveway in front of it, so we had to park at the top of the hill where there was an area off to the side of the road covered with crushed rock. We got there just in time to fulfill our plan of arriving at Witching Hour. As we walked down the hill, we saw the house. It basically looked exactly how you would picture an old abandoned farmhouse. Exposed gray wood, pieces of siding falling off, and old overgrown plants all around the entrance. There were two levels to the house. The first level had two windows on either side of the door, and the top had three windows. One to the left above the door, and to the right. As we walked closer, we saw that the door was open, so we dared each other to go inside. We formed a line to enter. Two of my friends, who were guys, went in in front of me, and I was the third in line to enter the house. The first guy is friend number one, the second is friend number two. As we enter, I immediately felt ice cold. I have never felt that kind of cold in my life, as in, I felt it all the way in my bones. As soon as I felt it, I heard friend number one scream at the top of his lungs. It all happened so fast that I could barely make out what it looked like inside. I mostly remember an uninviting couch laid across the stairs with the living room to the left of the stairs and the kitchen to the right. It was like walking back in time. Old floral wallpaper peeling off the walls. So the second that friend number one screams, we all run out of the house immediately. As I looked back toward the entrance, I noticed that only friend number two exited the house behind me and friend number one was still screaming inside. Like blood-curdling, in fear, scream. Friend number two runs back into the house and grabs friend number one and pulls him out. My first friend was so scared that he ran from the house screaming that something was holding him up by the air by his shirt. He rips off his shirt while he's running, and all I see are three big tears in the back of it. It looked as if three prongs from a pitchfork had ripped through the fabric, but it doesn't end there. As my second friend stepped foot outside the door, he begins yelling in pain. I looked back, and he had blood dripping all over his face. I literally felt like I was in a horror film. He came toward me, and I was in full instinct mode. I took my sweater off and gave it to him to try and stop the bleeding. He just yelled at me that something had hit him in the nose and that he needed to get to the hospital. So we run back up the hill, which felt like a thousand years, to the car. When we get into the car, I get friend number two tissues and clean up his nose and I shine my light on it to see what was bleeding. His right nostril had a clean cut all the way through it, as if someone had taken scissors or shears and cut it. And it gets worse. As we're driving away, my friend and I both look to the house and there's a candle lit in the top left window. Then, as I look to the other side of the road, I still want to cry when I think about this. I have the image and feeling just burned into me. And there's this old trailer with a light on and the silhouette of a man with a hat on in the window. I am 100% convinced that this old man was an evil spirit. Just the feeling I got of him staring at me, watching me as I drove by. I still feel the chills when I think about it. I felt like it was a warning to never come back to his property. Like he was the spirit that hurt both of my friends and that he was sending me a message. On the drive back, we ended up bringing my friend to the nearest ER, where they stopped the bleeding and stitched up his nose. He still has a scar from it, and his right nostril looks as if it were dog-eared from where it split apart through the stitches 
when it healed. I had a weird series of encounters as a child in my hometown that I have since moved back to, and I just chalked it up to sleep deprivation mixed with having a vivid imagination. This first one happened when I was really little. I'd say in 2004, maybe? 2003? I suck with dates. This was one of the first experiences that I had, and it's pretty fuzzy. All I really recall is being at the top of a flight of stairs and jumping down the whole thing, almost as if I could float down. I looked back on this one and I thought that maybe I had fallen down the stairs and just didn't remember. But in that case, I would have gotten a ton of scrapes and bruises because it was a big wooden staircase. Likely not related to the other experiences I had, but still, weird. There was some weird stuff in between these two, but I'd rather just get to the meat of it. Anyways, here's the biggest one that really bothers me. When I was in middle school, I was incredibly rebellious and decided to try running away from home in the fall of 2014. I got up in the middle of the night and just decided to walk straight down the road. Not sure what my plan was there. Anyways, I ended up following the highway until I ended up around Thunderbolt east of where I lived, and was stupidly proud of myself for not chickening out, and that I'd stopped crying. Anywho, I wandered some more, hopped some fences amid my adrenaline high, and ended up in these dense, really trashy woods. I started thinking over things, and crying again. Then I heard what sounded like my mom calling out my name from up on the highway, and instinctively ran away from it. I remember looking up to the highway and just seeing a person go limp and fall off the side and under the overpass in my direction, then start running toward me on all fours like some kind of creature. It was super dark, and I couldn't make out any features at all, and I wasn't interested in getting closer. So I just ran like the damn wind until my legs were shaking and I sat down in the underbrush. I was resting for a bit and still shaking and crying and all that. Then I heard my mom calling my name again. It sounded like it was the exact same volume, like it was from the same distance away. It almost sounded like a mosquito buzzing super quietly in my ear. I passed out for the night and then found my way back home in the morning. I thankfully ended up getting home safely and all I got was bars on my window scolding from my mom and a sandal to the head. Oh, and sleep paralysis just about every night of my life since. My boyfriend at the time and I went to Key West in 2014 for vacation back in my junior year of college. Doing some bar hopping, we went into the main strip's Coyote Ugly Bar. I ended up sitting next to this very thin, dark-haired woman. When I asked her if it was alright if I sat there, she turned her head toward me in an incredibly slow manner. She nodded her head up and down, equally slow. I don't think anything of it. My boyfriend and I order a drink, and we're talking amongst ourselves for a minute. I'm facing away from the woman, and I feel her tap on my shoulder. So I turn around, and she's raising her glass to me in cheers. I should explain what she looks like, because it's a lot like what I imagine a demon wearing human skin would look like. Bone thin, sallow, with stringy black hair, sharp cheekbones, and nose. Her eyes were black. I mean, huge black pupils that didn't blink. They looked static. She does her cheers and opens her mouth to smile and her gums are gray. Her teeth are gray and small and I remember having this overwhelming feeling that she wanted to eat my flesh. I'm in pretty much panic mode at this point and whip my head back toward my boyfriend. He saw this woman too by now and he grabs me by the arm to get us to move to the back of the room as quickly as possible. I'm basically cowering. 
I know, super brave. I always loved reading about demons, and possibly faced with one, I'm Jello. I turn to start making our way out to the street, and the woman has got her head completely cranked around to stare at me from the bar. I feel her gazing at me as we leave, and I haul ass back to the hotel. She didn't say a single word throughout the entire encounter. I always regretted not asking her to speak. I will say, my boyfriend and I talked about it after and considered the gray teeth and mouth and general craziness possibly due to drugs, but I've seen my fair share of drug addicts, even had one try to kidnap me, and this was not the same. I think about this episode pretty often, even years later. That feeling of encountering something soulless that wanted to harm me has never diminished. You have no reason to believe me, and you probably won't. I don't care. I just need to speak my truth, as it weighs on me sometimes. Since it happened in July, I told myself that I would take it to my grave out of fear. Fear of my significant other, family, and friends thinking that I'm crazy and ostracizing me. I have no history of mental illness, and I don't take meds, but I also just don't want to scare them. In July, around 10 to 12 a.m., I went to the kitchen with a blanket over me to grab a fork and a drink. I was carrying the drink in my right hand and the fork in my left as I struggled to keep the blanket wrapped around me. As I was heading back to the living room, I realized that the downstairs light and the ceiling light were on. I turned off the downstairs light with my left hand and looked to confirm that it was off. The ceiling lights were closer, so I continued on to turn the ceiling lights off behind me while looking down the stairs. The ceiling light flickered and burnt out, and I froze. A blue light appeared at the bottom of the stairs, and I cried, but it wasn't out of fear. I was already in a good mood, and it felt... comforting? I stared, and tears continued to pour down my cheeks. In awe, I walked left past the corner and stood there and continued to cry. For three minutes I stood there like that, questioning what I had seen. It appeared instantly after the lights burnt out. Could it have always been there? Who knows? I doubted my sanity and by the time I went back to look down the stairs, it was gone. As much as I tried to forget... The emotional attachment to what happened always helps me remember. I had to make a decision that night. Carry on with my life, or keep asking questions that I didn't have the answers to, and let it consume me and destroy me. I accepted that I may never know what it was, just that it is my truth, and I don't want to be afraid to share it. Honestly, I don't think I've ever experienced paranormal activity in terms of seeing something. But ever since I was a kid in my childhood home, I was really scared, almost traumatized, of seeing something or hearing something in the dark at night. No specific reason for it. I would just stare at the door frame of my room, which was always opened at night, and wait for something to show. I never even liked horror movies, and even now at 21 I avoid them because I know they freak me out, so I don't believe that the fear came from the movies. The thing is, I moved to a different city when I was 18 years old and changed a few apartments until now, and in every single one of them, I felt chills. Everything is fine, and then comes a certain time of night when it's like the energy in the room changes, and I have a feeling that someone is watching me. I always believed that if I could convince myself not to believe in spirits, or that the paranormal is real, then I can escape from that, and nothing weird will happen to me if I don't believe or give it attention. Am I right? But here we are. 
I started to think, what if the cold, watching feeling and fear I get every night is related to some childhood trauma that I might not remember? Fast forward to today. My boyfriend and I moved back to his parents' house after the lockdown. We have a separate upper apartment for ourselves and no one but him ever lived there. We have spent so many months and nights here before, and really the apartment never gave me any chills. Until the last month or so. So lately I have this really bad vibe in this place, especially at night. It can be dark outside around 6 p.m. or 10 p.m. and everything is super. Then there just comes this time, after midnight, when the air in the room changes and I feel like something negative has entered. The whole energy is negative, and the feeling of someone looking at me returns. Most of the time I'm scared to have my eyes open, that I might see something. He doesn't feel the same thing and says it's because of the stress and anxiety. And true, it might just be paranoia and I'm going crazy. But I had several nights when I really did feel like something was messing with me. I would wake up with the sensation like someone had pushed me, and my boyfriend was dead asleep. I would have sleep paralysis and again would have a feeling like someone is poking me and hear banging noises that weren't there. I was sleepless for a few nights and then I started taking Xanax just to make me fall into deep sleep to get some rest. When I am able to sleep, there's that time before falling into sleep when I feel the most vulnerable because of the dark and the dead silence. There are radiator noises and downstairs noises, which by the way are loud footsteps even in the middle of the night. And sometimes I would ask them if they were awake at the time, and they said they were sleeping. But still, I kind of comfort myself with the idea of it just being normal house noises. The worst thing is going to the bathroom at night. I have bladder issues, so it's normal for me to go at 1, 2 a.m. Don't know why, but I noticed this pattern. And often, I'm just terrified. I use my phone as a flashlight and practically run there. If I can hold it, I do, because that's how scared I am of the negative energy in the air. I'm so afraid of seeing a shadow or a face staring at me. It's like I know that something is present, but I'm unable to give it shape or form. Sometimes it's like I can sense someone's breath on my face. Never thought I would write something like this because it is the opposite of ignoring the problem and convincing myself that I am imagining, but I'm not sure what to do anymore. Every night I lay in my bed, and in just moments the air in the room switches to negative, cold, and spooky. I can't live like this. It's stressing me out so much, and I just want to know if it makes any sense. Am I crazy and too paranoid so that I just imagine all of this? Or could it really be that something is there? There has always been folklore around black crows and their cawing that my mother has always believed in. I've always been in love with anything creepy, so I bought into black crows aesthetically, but never actually believed that they served as an omen for death, as they're commonly known for. That was until I was told this story later in my life. My mother is from Central America and was born and raised there, only moving to the United States around 2000. She's always been superstitious. She would tell me when I was a kid to be careful around crows. Try not to let one fly in my path or disturb one because they symbolize death and can predict it if someone in your life is about to die. I was just a kid, so, again, I never really believed any of that and just promised to follow these rules to please her. It was still hot and sunny out when I was beginning elementary school and my mother and father were at home painting our back deck as we had just moved into a new house. This was the first house that we lived in since my mother moved from Central America to the States. All of my mother's family were thousands of miles away from her. She was always worried that something would happen to someone in her family while she was gone. My father was on all fours painting the deck, 
and my mother had come outside to give him a drink when a black crow swooped down right over my father's head. My mother immediately began to panic and cry. Before my father had a chance to ask her what was wrong, the home phone rang. My mother picked up the phone, crying, and burst into Spanish, asking, Is it Dad? And what happened? Before she even knew who was on the other side of the call. It was my mother's family calling to tell her that her father had indeed just passed away. I came home that evening and my father explained that my grandfather had passed on, but he didn't tell me of the crow story. When I was a little older, my mother had told me the story and my father confirmed the order of the events. That story is so strange to me, and ever since then I too have been wary of crows and their presence in my life. My mother said that she just knew her father had died in that moment. When the phone rang, she knew she was getting THE phone call. I find it interesting that the crow flew so low over my father, perhaps directly symbolizing that a father figure in someone's life had passed away. Where I live, around that time of year, a crow should have been nowhere in sight. There had not been any around that day, or for months even. All of it is just a little too bizarre and creeps me out to this day. This is a long one, but this is a true and factual story about my experience. I'd like to start by saying that I'm very skeptical when it comes to things people claim are paranormal. I don't just jump to conclusions that a strange event is caused by spirits. But some things I just can't wrap my head around or explain. I won't say that what happened to me and what I experienced was from a spirit, because I don't know 100%. All I know is that I'll never touch a Ouija board again, or be around one because the experience disturbed me for the better part of a year. Also, I'd like to add that this is only one of two paranormal events that I've ever personally experienced that I can say 100% that I don't know what happened. Here we go, starting with the background. I used to think that Ouija boards were a load of crap. I still kind of do. I really don't know how I feel about them anymore, actually. I always saw them as a party game for gullible people, so when my friend Joe, not his real name for privacy, told me that he had one, I just laughed it off. I had only known Joe for about a year or so after meeting through mutual friends. He lived in a small apartment with his girlfriend Lisa, also not her real name, and their dog Vincent. At the time, I was only 18. Joe was like 23, and Lisa was 20. For a period of time, I used to go over to their place every weekend after work because Joe bought me alcohol. So one night we were hanging out, and Joe starts talking about some strange encounters he had growing up and how he, quote unquote, attracted spirits his whole life or some garbage. I smiled and nodded to be polite while he went off on paranormal tangents and started talking about shadow people following him. He then goes into his room and pulls out a Ouija board, but not the one that you get at a store made by a toy company. It was made of real wood and hand carved. It was actually pretty nice. He said that he had gotten it as a birthday gift from his parents years ago because of his obsession with the paranormal. I didn't inquire as to where it had come from or who made it, but like I said, it looked handmade. While I sat there laughing and joking about it, Lisa chimes in and says, Joe, tell him about the other night. Joe proceeds to tell me how him and Lisa allegedly spoke to a demon using it, and the demon claimed that his name was Beelzebub. Me being a big metalhead at the time, he got my attention. Let's do it. Let's try to talk to this demon, I said, half joking. Joe asked if I was sure that I wanted to try it, and I agreed. So we went into his room. We turned off all the lights in the apartment. Lisa lit candles all around the room and we sat on the floor. I was nervous, but I was having fun watching Lisa and Joe's pageantry. It was spooky. I looked over at Joe and he seemed unsettled. 
I asked what was wrong, and he said that he wasn't feeling right. He didn't like the doors open displaying the darker areas of the apartment. Him and I got up and closed every door in the place, as in every room and every closet. We sat back on the floor and Vincent, the pup, laid on the bed. And we began. I forgot to add, this is very important. Before we started, I told Joe that I was skeptical of someone using their fingers to push the planchette around. So we all agreed to just use the back of our fingernails to touch it. Imagine just slightly bending your finger and placing the surface of your nail on the top. That's what we did. That way, even if you added pressure, your finger just slipped around on the planchette and didn't actually move it. We also made a rule. If the planchette moves, everyone has to lightly scratch the planchette with their nail to prove that none of us were the ones making it happen. What it looked similar to is placing your two fingers on the table and acting like their legs and running in place. I hope that helps you get the picture. No one was able to move it on their own. We tried several times to ask if there were spirits with us and got nothing. For about 20 minutes it continued that way. I told Joe I wanted to ask for someone in particular. Is John Smith here with us? Can John Smith talk to me? John Smith, obviously once again not his real name, was the name of my best friend's dad who was killed in a car crash while driving home from a fishing trip. That was when it moved. And it was absolutely insane. It felt like a great force just came to life in the planchette, like it had a mind of its own. None of that gliding around the board crap that you see in movies. This thing felt like we were holding onto a person's hand who was tugging and pulling. It was strong, but articulate movement, and it spelled out, hello. I asked him if he was John, and it spelled, yes. I asked him to prove it, and it spelled out the name of my best friend. I asked him where he was when he passed, and he spelled, lake. I had chills down my spine. What I thought was just going to be fun had turned into being emotional and scary. Joe and Lisa knew nothing about John Smith. I never mentioned him or brought up anything about the circumstances, so they couldn't have known. I began to grow very unsettled. I told Joe and Lisa that I didn't want to talk to John anymore, so they told me to push the planchette to goodbye or whatever it was. I called it a night after that, but I wanted more. Next night, I was back. Same routine, John and Lisa set up the room, John closed all the doors, Vincent was on the bed. Lisa said that she wanted to talk to her grandma, so we did the process. It was the same incident for her as it was for me. Memory is kind of fuzzy, but it spelled out I love you, and also spelled out some sort of inside joke that she used to share with her grandmother. Lisa was in tears. As with me, I had no info on her grandma, and Joe wasn't that cruel to make her cry as a joke. I felt powerful. I think we all did. I felt like I was finally a believer, that we had an actual way of talking to spirits. The possibilities. But then, it happened. After the incident with Lisa's grandma, we were all kind of in shock. Joe was comforting Lisa, and I was speechless. We regained our composure and got back to it. This time we were asking the normal, are there any spirits with us? What usually left the planchette lifeless suddenly kicked in with great force. Scary force. The planchette moved violently around the board. We all kind of laughed nervously. We asked, who are you? The planchette shot to the moon symbol. If you don't know, this allegedly means a dark spirit. We all looked at each other and then simultaneously moved the planchette to goodbye. As soon as we did, Vincent jumped up and ran off of the bed. He sat and stared as if looking at someone. We had that door closed before. Joe jumped up and said, F this, and ran into the kitchen. Lisa and I followed. Joe about nearly had a panic attack. He rushed to turn on all the lights. I've never seen him act that way. We were all pretty scared. We don't know what happened, but we had that door closed for sure. 
After some talking and calming each other down, I left. I didn't sleep that night. I had never seen anything like that. After that night, I felt like I was being followed constantly. For almost a year, I slept with the lights on. That year ended up being one of the worst years of my life. I fell into a depression and was incredibly paranoid. I just couldn't shake the feeling that something was always watching me. I continued to go to Joe and Lisa's place occasionally, but we never touched the board again. We ended up having a falling out some months later over unrelated drama and never communicated after that. Like I said, that year was horrible for me. I started drinking a lot and tried to get over the feeling. I always felt like my energy was being sapped, like the air was heavy and I struggled to find joy. The depression was real. Then the experience hit a peak. I was sleeping one night and woke up in a panic. I couldn't breathe. I felt as if someone was literally sitting on my chest. I gasped for air. Suddenly I felt like what was someone grabbing my feet and trying to pull me off of my bed. I instantly went into a struggle trying to kick out as hard as I could. Then all at once, it stopped. I was horrified. Nobody was in my room. I lost even more sleep after that incident. I ended up finally getting a hold on my life. I started going to the gym instead of drinking and wallowing in my pity. I started meditating instead of playing video games. After that year, it all went away. It was like I was free from that negative energy again, and I have been fine ever since. That's the story of my Ouija board experience. I'm still not sure if all of it was in my head, or if that night was just some sort of stress-induced panic attack, but whatever it was, I cannot explain it. People have told me that demons thrive off your energy, and that that is what might have happened, but I'm just not sure. Perhaps it was the demon talking to us all along, pretending to be our loved ones? If such a thing exists, I'm just glad that whole experience is in my past. I'll never touch a Ouija board again, though. Recently I moved into a new house. Two close friends, let's call them E and R, moved in along with me. When we went to view the house, nothing seemed off about it. However, about a week in, we screwed up. E had been cleaning out the attic and came across a wooden box. It looked fairly new and we didn't think anything could ever go wrong with it. E and I looked inside the box. All that was there was four candles, an old matchbox with no matches, and a small wooden doll. E and I set it aside, not interested. We ended up putting it back in the attic, apart from the doll, which R wanted to put in her potted plant. We proceeded with our sorting and forgot all about the box. That night, when I went to bed, I felt as if I were being watched. It was unnerving, but I eventually fell asleep. A few hours later, I heard something bang against the floor above me. I would have brushed it off as E, as his room was up there, if what had happened next didn't take place. For a bit of background knowledge, in September of 2017, R was in a car crash. The others were fine, but R ended up in a wheelchair. R called out for me. It wasn't calm as it usually was but frantic. I moved into her room, and she asked me if I had heard the crash. I told her I had and thought that it was just E. She looked me dead in the eye and told me that E was working a night shift. It was unlike her to be so flustered, so I offered to stay with her, which she accepted. Soon after, we began to hear light footsteps and giggles outside R's room. We were scared, but continued to try and tune it out. R fell asleep, but I stayed with her, scared shitless by possible ghost children. 
Eventually, the stupid undead kids stopped running up and down the halls, so I assumed they left. I was then able to fall into a well-deserved slumber. Then, maybe an hour or so later, E got back from work. I know this because he is incapable of entering anywhere quietly. And then, he screamed. Like a grown man screaming as if he were a little girl. He ran up the stairs into my room, and then out of my room because I was with R, and then he ran into R's room. He then told us what had happened. Apparently, he had been putting his work bag down, and felt as if he were being watched. He looked up, and for a split second saw a little boy and girl holding hands. Now, normally I wouldn't have believed anything like this, but E is an honest bloke and I saw the look of terror on his face. I remember around 12 years ago, when I was around 11 or 12, I stayed over at my grandmother's a lot to keep her company after my grandfather passed away. I was lying in bed one night, I had just turned the TV off to go to sleep when I heard a creaking sound outside the door, but I just thought it was Grandma going to the bathroom since she had to walk past my room to get there. Then, I heard the handle being pulled down, and again I just thought it was my Grandma maybe just coming in to say goodnight before bed. As I looked toward the door, I saw a large, white hand grip the edge of the door, and instantly I knew it wasn't her. I was too terrified to say or do anything, so I just kept watching as the door slowly opened. Because of the window at the top of the stairs outside the room, there was just enough light from the street lights outside coming through to see what it was. It was a tall, slightly transparent figure. It just stood in the doorway for what could have been seconds or minutes, or who really knows how long. I couldn't look away, and I refused to shut my eyes, even to blink, but of course, I had to eventually, and once I blinked, the figure was gone, with only the open door as proof that it wasn't my imagination. To this day, I still don't know what it was. I told my friends before, and they said it could have been my grandfather's ghost, but it was way too tall and skeletal looking to be my grandfather in my opinion, and I felt a deep, sinister feeling from it that couldn't be further from the warm, loving person that my grandfather had been. I've had a few odd experiences with things before that I could chalk up to imagination or overreacting, but as they say, you have to see it to believe it. And after that day, I certainly believe. Ever since, it's had me wondering what else could be out there. People often wonder what would happen if they used a Ouija board. Some people do it for fun, some people use it for spiritual communications. I can tell you now that if you have no experience in using a Ouija board, do not do it. This is a story about what happens when you use one for fun without knowing the consequences. When I was about 12, it was Halloween night, go figure, and we had just had a Halloween party for family and friends. A few of my older sister's friends stayed the night that night, and we were just hanging out in our room, which we shared. One of her friends had a spirit tethered to her. That's what she claimed. Whether or not it was true, I still don't know to this day, and she said, let's go for it. I wanted nothing to do with it, but being 12 years old and curious, I had to observe. They didn't follow any of the rules that you're supposed to as far as not putting it on a blanket, not lighting the proper candles, and other things that you're supposed to do prior to using the Ouija board. They were just calling on spirits that they could think of and trying to communicate with them. That's where things got a little creepy. If I remember correctly, one of the spirits that came to the board was a woman, and she was not friendly. She began to spell out profanities, and they quickly shut that down. I can't remember what the second spirit was, but it was also not friendly and called itself Satan. 
All of a sudden, one of my sister's friends began to panic. She said she saw a man out on the street with a red and black face. We did not see the man out on the street, so I don't know if she was having a panic attack and seeing things or what. The next event that occurred was kind of insane and terrifying. All of a sudden, my sister started zoning out and staring at nothing. We tried to get her attention, and she gave no response. Then she got up and walked downstairs, and we were confused, so we just followed her. We heard something in the kitchen, so we went and checked that out. My sister was standing over the sink taking knives from the counter in the knife holder, and she was throwing them into the sink one after the other. We try to get her attention again, and again, she refuses to respond to us. Then she goes and grabs the coffee pot off of the coffee maker and drinks black coffee straight out of it. Mind you, she hated coffee at the time. She drank the entire thing. She got up and went to sit on the couch, and a couple of minutes later, she blinked and came to. She asked us why we were staring at her, and how did she get downstairs. To this day, she has no memory of what happened, and it is 21 years later. We're pretty sure that a spirit took over her body just to have some fun. My grandma, after my mom told her what had happened, came into the house and blessed it with holy water. It seemed to help for a while, and then I had the series of nightmares a year or so later, so I'm wondering if the holy water didn't really have much effect. So this is a lesson learned and a disclaimer to anyone who wants to mess with a Ouija board. If you have no real experience with it, do not go there. You never know what you're going to be inviting into your home. This is a real story in this area. People actually report seeing this. It's a tale that comes from a little town in Lancaster County, a place called Elizabethtown. It's called the Purple Light Bridge, and it's a story that began in the early 1900s. Could be more than a tale, though, since there is proof of the Purple Light and the tragic incident behind it. So one of the tales is that a young boy is struck by a train on the bridge that intersects between Turnpike and Road Street, which is where the train station for Amtrak is. It supposedly happened in 1934, and some people claim that there is proof of the accident. So after the boy's death, it is said that late at night you can see a purple light on the bridge or in the gorge where the train track ran into from the north heading southwest. People like to argue that you can see the light at another location, and that it's been there not only by the train station itself. They claim that you can see the lights under the bridge that is above the train tracks on Bossler Road. Bossler Road, for this purple light, had another tale. A mother brought her son to the bridge, and under that bridge, she hung her son, and then herself. Locals say that the purple light that you see is the mother and the son as one energy. Some people have claimed that the purple light comes from the moonlight reflecting off of the rocks below. Yet even more people claim that it's actually the bridge a couple miles away in Newville near Elizabethtown. I have not yet tried to investigate, but certainly intend to. I have lived in my apartment for three years now, and other than things falling randomly that I would usually blame on my cats, I have never experienced anything paranormal. My boyfriend claims to see white lights at night in our bedroom, but I don't know. I feel there is always a logical explanation for things. Yesterday, I felt particularly spooked in my apartment, and I felt like someone was behind me, like felt a presence. But also, 
I am a fat baby when it comes to these things, so I never take myself seriously. Anyway, this is where it gets weird. That night, my phone rang. I was expecting a call from my best friend, so I pick up and say hello. What I heard was a doll-like voice, laughing and giggling. She has a one-year-old daughter who does not sound like that, but I just assumed it was her, so I was like, aw, hi, all the while being creeped the F out and wondering what her daughter, who goes to bed at 8, was doing up at 12 a.m. Then it quickly cut to my friend and she was like, was that you? What are you doing? Tell me, are you joking with me? I felt the blood leave my face. I was like, no, what did you hear? Thinking she heard the same thing, or maybe some static. She was in shock. She told me she heard a demonic man voice say, hello, clearly, and then cut to me saying hello. We spent the next few minutes arguing, as she thought I was joking with her and I thought she was joking with me, even though she was not the type of person to do something like that. We established that it could have just been a weird glitch or something and left it at that. I am so spooked from this, though. Has anyone experienced something like it? I never heard a sound like that in my life, other than maybe in movies. I'm glad she heard something too, because I feel like no one would have believed me. I don't usually get static or anything on my cell phone. Neither of us were watching something on it beforehand, and the sounds we heard were clear as day. Help me find a logical explanation. This happened last night. I am currently car camping. I woke up last night for a whiz, and while I was doing my thing, I could see a floating, irregularly shaped light off to my left, about two meters, six feet, away. I didn't feel scared, more of a what is that kind of feeling. I'm trying to think of the best way to describe this, so please bear with me. Its appearance was kind of like a parallelogram, except the short edges were jagged and ripped into two long appendages. It was kind of a milky white in color, with no light emanating from it. It floated in a straight line and came to a tree where it did three little hops and then disappeared around the tree. I finished my business, but didn't have my phone. I did have a flashlight, so thinking it was someone in the trees, I shone the beam through the trees, but nothing reflected back. I turn around to go back and get in the car, and the light thing is dancing around the back of my car, right beside me. I was able to walk up to it and try to touch it. I say try because my hand just touched the car. But the even weirder thing was that when I touched it, my hand created a shadow over the top of it. It was like it had no feeling at all, like just going through air. After it floated around the car, it disappeared around the side, and I lost sight of it altogether. I climbed back in the car for sleep, but was incredibly baffled, and prepped my phone just in case that thing floated through the window. This is a story from my life that I've told to people, especially teens, to warn them to never use a Ouija board. When I was a senior in high school in 1989, my brother came home from college on spring break and told stories about him and some friends using a Ouija board. It had done some things to freak them out, so we dug out the one that we had in our attic. I don't know why we had it or where we got it from. He showed me what they had done, but nothing happened to us. I brought it to a friend's house and we tried it out a few times over the course of several evenings, and then about the third or fourth time, it really started to pick up in its responses. 
We had been starting by knocking three times on the corner of the board and saying something like, Come, spirit. Or something to that effect. Anyway, the marker really started to move around the board and spell things out. I always tell people that it was either our subconsciouses or a spirit moving it around, because I was certain that neither of us were moving it intentionally. With a light touch of a few fingers from each of our hands, it would just move around on its own as if it had its own personality. We would ask it all the usual questions, test questions, and curiosity ones. One day, though I wasn't a fan of it, my friend asked the board in which years we would each die. It spelled out something like 2040 or 40-ish for my friend. I don't actually remember the number, just that it was far into the future at the time. And 1990 for me, which was the next year. I asked, does that mean that I'm going to die in 1990 and my friend in 2040? No, it said. Then I asked again, this time switching the years around between us. Yes, it said. We asked the spirit about itself. It claimed that it had died the year my friend's father was born, and said that its name was Stephen Crane. We kind of laughed at that part. Of course, I looked up some dates about the author after that, but things just didn't seem to jive. I just thought, well, it could be another person with that name, and moved on. We started to invite other friends over to watch, who were all entirely skeptical. By the end of the evening, every single one was freaked out. More and more friends would come each night until we started getting a huge group of people. The board would answer plenty of test questions wrong, but then, for example, while everyone's reacting to the wrong answer and half paying attention, it's spelling out, sorry. Another time, for example, in a lull between activity while people were distracted and chatting, it moved slowly to S, then kept circling around to H, 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 until it came to a stop there. There was nothing else for about two minutes. The entire room of people was completely silent, and then it slowly moved to OK. It said a bad spirit had passed through the room. Once again, everyone freaked out. It didn't like this one friend, and every time he entered the room, when we had those gatherings, the marker would twist and move to the opposite side of the board. Other things like that happened. Again, it was like it had its own personality. I remember a few times driving home with that thing in the back seat of the car, terrified, with my heart pounding. One time I asked it, where will I go to college? It spelled out one of the schools I was applying to, and then 37. I asked it if I was going to go to that school and get a 3.7 GPA the first semester, and it said yes. I was sure all along that my friend was not moving it intentionally, but I had proof because one day he was really disturbed and frustrated with his girlfriend, a friend of mine. He had suspected that she was cheating on him, and he asked the board a question about her while using it with a friend, and it told him to turn on the TV. The video for the song, What You Don't Know Might Hurt You, by Expose, was playing on TV. I remember that he really took that to heart, and it affected his trust in their relationship. I always knew that he wasn't just playing around with the board, and that was a sort of hard proof to that fact. We started to actually use the board with our friends, but it only worked when one of us too used it with someone else. We asked the spirit why that was, and it responded that the spirit was inside my friend and that I was the owner of the board. Freaky stuff thinking back on it now. But as an 18 year old, you think differently. Anyway, the enthusiasm started to peter out after a few months, maybe near the end of the summer, and I don't really know what happened to the Ouija board. I did end up going to that college that the board mentioned, but it didn't really catch my attention. When I got home from my first semester after 1990 had just begun, I got my grades and had a 3.7 GPA. I don't remember if I made the connection or not, but I certainly did when the next thing happened. Around the same week or so, maybe even around the same day, I got the annual catalog that my college sends out with articles and updates and whatnot. 
I opened it up, and there, right in front of me, was an entire article about Stephen Crane. He had gone to my college for a while, and I never had any clue about it. I remember having chills. Finally, the sad part is that later in 1990, after returning to college classes after Thanksgiving break, my friend, one of my best friends, died suddenly and unexpectedly from a heart problem. I don't know when I made the connection with the board, because by then it was over a year later. But at some point, I did, and when I did, I started to put the whole storyline together. It sank in more how creepy and dark the whole thing was. I am happy in life, very blessed. I did go through a form of spiritual growth some years ago where this darkness was left behind, and the story of my past doesn't haunt me. I share it in the hope that it's helpful for others, but I would never touch a Ouija board again, and would strongly advise against anyone else using one. To this day, I'm still positive that it was not our conscious action at work, but either our subconsciouses or truly a spirit. Whichever of those you might believe that it is, nothing good comes from playing around with either one of them. At the minimum, negligence can open up a path for psychological and emotional problems. At worst, relating with a spirit can let in a darkness and fear beyond your understanding or strength that can tint your life and affect you for quite some time to come. A couple of years ago, me and some friends had a short-lived phase of trying to go and explore as many cool, abandoned places as we could. One of these was a very old hospital that had been closed for roughly 20 to 30 years, I believe. It was pretty central, in a big town, so it was quite regularly maintained as far as terms of boarding up windows, doors, etc. to keep people out. Our first visit started with us climbing through a window near the middle of the building. We pried a plyboard board up from the window, but as soon as me and three other friends got in that room and opened the door into the main hallway, we agreed pretty quickly that we shouldn't be there and left. Unusual for us, as we quite clearly weren't scared of much if we were easily able to break and enter into a building in the middle of town. We'd also never been scared and anxious of anywhere before, and it's weird that all of us agreed that we should leave straight away. Our second visit is where it got properly weird. We went back about two weeks later, and all of the plyboard on the windows was replaced with metal sheets. Which isn't strange for a building in a large town where people break in regularly, apart from the fact that the window that we went through originally was completely open. We climbed through anyway, and got all the same feelings again, except when we tried to open the door into the hallway. It was locked, and felt as if something was pushed up against the other side of it. We went back through the window, and I was last. As I was about halfway out of the window, I heard a young girl's laugh pretty much directly behind me in this small room, and I nearly fell out of the window trying to get away from it. I thought it was my mind playing tricks on me at first, until one of my friends asked if I had heard that laugh, and that's why I jumped through this window. All my other friends had heard it too, and said it sounded like it had come from inside the room. All of this is pretty normal stuff, and I'm sure that the door being locked or having something behind it was just someone moving stuff around inside if them and their friends were exploring too. The young girl's laugh that we all heard from the room we were in, and how we felt on both visits, is what we can't explain. I was 19 years old and a trainee manager for Sainsbury's, a UK supermarket chain. I was working with a colleague on the shop floor, looking down the aisle. I saw a 30-something-year-old mother pushing a very severely deformed child in a wheelchair. Although I wasn't aware then, but since have become aware, 
I wasn't aware then, but since have become aware that the child had probably been born with hydrocephalus, leaving its head distended with fluid. The child also only had one arm, and was sort of curled up in the chair as if pained. As they passed us, we pulled... As they passed us, we pulled our restocking trolley out of the way, and just as they were adjacent to us, the child let out a terrible sort of howl. To be honest, it left me shaken for several minutes. Two or three days later on the weekend, I was invited to a party at a friend's place. Just a quiet meal and drinks with a few people that I knew. After food and a few drinks, the girl whose flat it was suggested that we try the Ouija board that she had recently bought. I was a total skeptic of the Ouija, although agreed to play for a bit of fun. It was a proper sort of wooden painted board, although there was no pointer, just a small crystal glass that those playing put their finger on. After about 20 minutes in, I thought it felt a bit odd the way that the glass felt like it was gliding so smoothly over the board and actually spelling out some of the responses to questions and even claiming to be a local spirit of our town. We carried on for a while and, although weird, nothing about the responses were threatening or unpleasant. My friend turned to me and said, ask it a question that nobody here or anyone else would know the answer to. I thought for a few seconds and spoke aloud. I was thinking of the child in the store, and I said, What did I see at work the other day? I felt the glass move under our fingers, and it said quickly, very positively, Effing evil troll child. I felt physically sick and was actually heaving. I jumped away and fell onto the floor. I then blacked out for a few minutes, resulting in my friends calling an ambulance in panic. When it arrived, I had calmed down a bit, and they just checked my vitals and left. My friend drove me home, and although I was alright, I had nightmares involving that child for several months. Today I believe that there are definitely consequences to messing with that sort of stuff, and it is absolutely best left well alone. That was over 25 years ago, and I remember that incident as if it happened just yesterday. For years, I've dealt with the disappearing object phenomenon, but lately, items have started appearing or reappearing as well. Just this morning, for example, I woke up and went into my kitchen to make coffee, and a random pack of paper coffee cups was sitting in the middle of my kitchen counter. No one else lives here or has access to my house, and I always set an alarm at night, so I would hear it if someone had tried to get in. I literally have no clue where this pack of coffee cups came from. It just appeared out of thin air. I'm grateful in a way, because it sure was convenient to have the cups this morning, but still, who put them there? I even checked my Amazon history to see if somehow I bought these without remembering, but no such purchase was there. I've had other objects randomly appear in my bathroom, too. Lip glosses that aren't in a color that I would normally buy. I've had strange food items that I didn't buy appear in my pantry, too. Boxed soups, ketchup, I don't even like it, mustard, don't use it that much, and a random bottle of soy sauce. I don't even know what to think about this. This happened to my dad, who told me this story when I accidentally discovered a Ouija board in a closet in our house. He was living in Spain at the time, and during the 1970s, he bought that Ouija board. He told me that one day he talked too much with a wise entity who responded to everything so clearly and philosophically. The thing is, my dad asked it, where are you? And the board started to mark random numbers and letters such as 165, 2AC, 8820, that kind of thing. My dad, who was consternated, thought that it was decontextualized. 
nonetheless, and he cannot explain why. He wrote down the entire random series of numbers, and he cannot explain why. He wrote down the entire random series of numbers and letters on a paper that he had left sitting on a shelf. The disturbing part after that is that a few years during the 1980s, later, my dad was watching Cosmos with Carl Sagan, and he told me that in that show, Sagan explained that scientists had discovered a new galaxy that was called with a sequence of numbers and letters. My dad was so impressed. So he copied down the name of the show, and he looked for the paper on the shelf. And yes, it was the same sequence. My dad is fascinated with this experience and told me that the Ouija is not just spiritual, it is also interdimensional. When he told me, I was between scared and curious, and I considered aliens using the Ouija board. He still believes that this wise entity is up there somewhere talking with others. I believe in the paranormal, but I will go out of my way to weigh out every logical explanation that I can possibly think of before assuming that something is paranormal. I've told myself that this is sleep paralysis to make myself feel better, but it was such an odd encounter. I was 14 at the time that this occurred. I'm now in my late 20s. And I was really into gothic stuff, witchcraft, spooky shit, etc. I had a friend who had a Ouija board and wanted to come spend the night and play with it. Of course, I jumped on the idea, so she came right over. As I predicted, absolutely nothing happened. Though at one point the piece did slide off of the board, but we ended up blaming each other. I'm still pretty sure it was her. After a while, as I said, we got bored and we gave up and went to sleep. About a week later, I came home from school and felt tired, which was abnormal for me because I'd normally throw my backpack down and immediately go outside, but I decided that I would take a nap. No one was home except me. I went to bed and passed out immediately. I woke up and couldn't move and panicked. I've never had sleep paralysis before, nor had I even heard of it. So needless to say, this was horrifying. I then levitated off of my bed and toward the middle of my room, where I began to rotate in a slow circle. I felt like I was screaming internally, yet no sound was coming out of me, and then I finally woke up. I bolted out of my room and stayed up for the rest of that day. My mom insisted that it was sleep paralysis, and reassured me that it happens to people sometimes, so I thought nothing of it, and moved on. About a month later, it happens again at night this time. I floated toward the center of the room like before, and promptly from there was slammed against my upper walls and ceiling by some sort of force that I couldn't see. I could feel its hands on me though, and I could physically feel myself hitting the wall. I felt tingly as well, as if my soul might fly out of me. I don't know exactly how to describe this feeling. It was almost like I was vibrating? Like when your foot falls asleep, but the needle jab numbness feeling doesn't feel quite painful. It was strange. I thought it was just sleep paralysis and reminded myself that I was dreaming to try and calm down, and started sort of willing myself to wake up, if that makes sense. I woke up, put on some music, and went back to sleep, and slept fine. The next morning I got up for school and was absolutely covered in bruises. It literally looked as though someone had beaten me with a baseball bat. So I told my mom, who said that I had probably just thrashed around in my sleep. This wouldn't be possible though, because I slept on a very soft, queen-sized mattress and I'm a small person. I even went around my bed to see if there's anything that I could have bumped into. There was nothing. She said maybe I had hit myself in my sleep. But there were bruises on my back and shoulders too, so it just didn't make sense. I tried to just brush it off, but by this point I was getting really paranoid. For the next few weeks I would have instances where I would start to fall asleep. My body would tingle like it did in the last experience, and I knew that if I let myself fall asleep that I would have the weird sleep paralysis again. 
so I would force myself awake and adjust my sleeping position and then try to fall asleep once more. I would do this repeatedly until I could finally drift off without this tingly sensation. This became a daily thing, but I was okay with that because I figured out how to basically avoid sleep paralysis and thought that the creepy dreams were over with. A couple of months go by with no incidents and I had pretty much forgotten about it. By this point, it never really crossed my mind anymore, but I would still have the tingly feeling from time to time. It was Saturday. My mom was out with friends, my siblings were visiting family, and I was home alone. I kept feeling very strongly like I was being watched, but I told myself that I was just being paranoid and that it was nothing. This is where it gets weird. I'm sitting on my bed, wide awake, writing in my journal. It's about 9 p.m. or so, the radio is on full blast, and all of a sudden I'm snatched off of my bed while wide awake by this invisible thing. I start screaming, and it starts slamming me into walls again. Finally, after a few minutes, it stops, and I float back to the center of the room, where I slowly start spinning in circles mid-air, much like the first experience. Only this time I can see myself lying on my bed on my back with my legs crossed as they were when I was sitting there, hyperventilating with my eyes open while some sort of figure sits next to me. It looked like it would be extremely tall if it stood up. It was skinny with a masculine looking build. Think tall and very skinny but muscular man. It had shoulder length wavy hair, though it was really more of just like a shadowy outline of hair. Its body was made up of swirling black smoke only, and I don't know how to explain this any better. This smoke was darker than just being black. Like, imagine if the color black could be darker than it already is. That's what that color was. I have literally never seen a color this dark anywhere else. It was like seeing a color that no one has ever seen. The thing had big yellow almond-shaped eyes and a tiny black pupil in the middle of each one, but I couldn't discern any facial features. It didn't move. It just sat there staring at me for what felt like hours. Finally, I jump awake, and I'm laying in a pool of sweat. I immediately start crying and flipping out because, like I said before, I did not fall asleep. I was wide awake and sitting up when this happened. I wasn't even thinking about sleep. I wasn't even tired. My pen was still in my hand. My radio was still up loud, and my legs were still crossed. Maybe I fainted, but that's never happened to me before. Thankfully, we moved shortly after that, and it never happened again. But to this day, the hair on my arms stands up when I remember this thing. I've read a lot about sleep paralysis demons and experiences, and nothing seems to quite match what happened to me. This story comes from my girlfriend, who told me that a couple of months ago her mom was exiting an office that she works at in the middle of the night when she saw an apparition. She described it as looking like a very abnormally large black dog that was staring her down in the parking lot. Apparently the dog charged at her and vanished as it went through her, never to be seen again after that. Now, my girlfriend's mom is no stranger to the paranormal and has tons of crazy stories, and this being the latest incident, she knew it meant something bad. She called my girlfriend frantically, asking her to check on her grandpa, who they were taking care of for about a year at that point, but he was okay. Two days later, however, he passed on. This also happened to my girlfriend's grandma on her mom's side, where she was outside and saw a large black dog on the roof of her house staring her down until it jumped down and vanished into her as well. Her first husband died after she received this visit from the dog. From what I could take from the story, it seemed more immediate than just two days. 
It was the first I've ever heard of a large black dog figure appearing, and a few hours later, my curiosity led me to searching for similar experiences online. I stumbled across mythology and folklore, speaking of how large black dogs and or hellhounds are omens of death. When I was about 15 years old, I was a very curious teenager. I had only heard stories of the Ouija board, but had never actually tried it. So one weekend, my best friend slept over, and we decided to take our chances. My mom was super against me buying one, and she would have killed me if I would have brought one into her home. So my best friend and I took a big poster board and made our own Ouija board. We lit candles and turned off all the lights. It was about 1 a.m., and everyone in the house was asleep. When we started out, it was slow, but then the planchette started moving all around the board. I was convinced that my best friend was the one moving the piece around, but she denied it, and I trusted her not to lie. We asked how they died, and they just said, sick. After a bunch of other questions, we asked, how can you prove that you are who you really say that you are? They responded with, cemetery. I don't fully remember all the questions that we asked, but I know that it led to Charlie giving us some details. He said that his gravestone was by a path and a tree, small, round, with the year 1820. My mom's house is literally right across the street from a cemetery. I can look out the window and directly into it, so we are very, very close. It is an extremely old, historical colonial cemetery dating back to 1690. The next day, my best friend and I went over to the burial ground and started our wild goose chase for Charlie's headstone. Lo and behold, we found it. It was exactly as he described. His headstone was cylinder-shaped, the name Charlie was listed, and he was born in 1810 and died in 1820. Behind the stone was a huge tree, and it was right next to a pathway. I could not believe that the Ouija board actually worked. After discovering Charlie's grave, my best friend and I would sit and visit him every day after school. We would go hang out there when we were bored. Sometimes we would just sit next to him, smoke cigarettes, and talk. Maybe Charlie was just one lonely kid and wanted some friends. So that's what we gave him. This happened a few years ago while I was still in college. My best friend of many years is back in town, so we decided to get together and we stayed out fairly late, but hey, we're college kids, nighttime is our thing. My friend is very, very Catholic, and she decided to drive us this night. Mind you, neither of us was doing any drinking. After many shenanigans and lots of catching up, it was time to go home. It was probably around 2, 3 a.m., Still not exhausted, but she definitely was. Well, I'm staring at her dash where one of her many Catholic baubles were in the car when we get to the last light before she drops me at my house. I look out the window, as one does, and was met with the person in the car next to us staring into the car, and I kid you not, I screamed. The guy had gray skin black eyes with no white, and a smile that was too long with sharpened teeth. He didn't break eye contact with me, and I was freaking out. My friend was completely oblivious until I said her name. She somehow didn't hear me scream. I, as calmly as possible, told her to look at the guy in the car next to us, and then she silently screamed too and then proceeded to freak out and gunned it out of the intersection. Once again, this was 3 a.m., the light was still red, and she was not having this. She sped to my house and had me watching behind the car to make sure that we weren't being followed, whilst praying aloud, something she never does as she knows that I'm not religious. 
A few very short moments later, she pulls up in front of my house. She also put her high beams on as I walked to my door because she was, again, not about this. After I was safely inside, she called my cell and had me on the phone until she made it to her house all of three minutes later. We were both really shaken up about it the next day, but we never talked about it again. Anytime I've tried to bring it up, she shudders and changes the topic immediately. She did tell me she went to be blessed the next day, on a random Tuesday. I can still feel the soul-shaking sensation of looking that guy in the eyes. I'm not saying it couldn't have been some dude dressed up in a costume or something, but it shook both of us to our core. It was a Monday night, at around 3 in the morning, and I honestly don't feel like this was a normal human occurrence. When I was approximately 14, 15 years old, circa 1988-89, myself and my family had two summer holidays in Portugal, one following on from the previous year. The first holiday included myself, my older sister, mom and dad, and an uncle and aunt. The second holiday the following summer was the same people except my sister who stayed at home. Both holidays were in the same location, and both times we stayed in the same villa, which was owned by a business associate of my uncle. As such, I believe the accommodation was free, and that's why it was such a great holiday option for us all. The villa was situated about a 15 minutes walk outside of a well-known town. The first holiday where my sister was also present was event-free, and nothing unexplained happened at all. The second holiday was where I alone experienced an absolutely terrifying paranormal event, which has stayed with me to this day. The villa we stayed in was on one level, as most villas are, and had a pretty standard layout. The main door at the front led straight into a kitchen, and that led into the main lounge area. Off to the left and the right of the main lounge were two ensuite bathrooms where my parents and uncle and aunt slept. I slept on a fold-out bed in the lounge area, and out to the back of the property was a small swimming pool. From memory, it was a very nice, spacious villa, and probably worth quite a bit of money. Nothing happened for the entire two-week period that we were there, except for the final night of the holiday. I often say thank God that we flew home the next morning, because I don't think I could have stayed there another night. On this final evening, everyone had just gone to bed and closed their doors, and I had just finished setting up my bed and finally turned out the lights and got under the covers. No longer than 30 seconds after getting into bed, I began to hear tapping on one of the walls. I laid there trying to guess what it might be, and just figured that it was probably one of my parents or uncle or aunt doing something in their rooms, so I ignored it. I then heard the same tapping again, but louder. I sat up in bed and tried to pinpoint where it was coming from. This is how I know that it wasn't sleep paralysis, as some people have often suggested to me, because I was peering across the dimly lit lounge room. It was then that the tapping started to spin around the room, as if the knocking was circling me as I sat there. This was naturally pretty unnerving, and I struggled to rationalize what was taking place. It was at that point that the tapping stopped, and immediately a wooden chair from the lounge room dining table made a scraping sound against the wood parquet floor that it was resting on. The sort of scraping noise a chair would make if you pulled it out from under the table to sit on it. At this point, I didn't know what was going on, and being as young as I was, I think fear got the better of me, and I shot down into the bed, turned around, and pulled the sheets up under my chin and closed my eyes. But unfortunately, it didn't end there. Next, I heard more scraping as dining chairs were being moved, followed by a very quiet but very distinct shuffling noise, which sounded like shuffling footsteps. These footsteps got louder as whatever it was began to approach me in the room. As it approached, I then heard this mumbling in what sounded like guttural, low-key talking, but in a language that I didn't understand or recognize. It certainly wasn't Portuguese. 
On top of this mumbling, I suddenly began to hear this terrifying, rasping breathing in and out in a very rhythmic fashion, the sort of rasping that someone with severe breathing difficulty would make. This breathing got louder and louder until it was right behind me, right next to my head, on the pillow, rasping loudly into my right ear. Petrified doesn't even cut it. I was simply frozen with fear. I don't think I could have turned around even if I had wanted to. This loud, heavy breathing continued for what seemed like a lifetime, but in reality was probably about 30 or 40 seconds, and then it slowly faded away and the room was left in silence. I laid in the bed for about another hour, unable to sleep, and listening intently for anything else, but there was nothing. Eventually I fell asleep, probably through nervous exhaustion, and when I next woke up it was 6 a.m. and daylight filled the room, and I recall the sheer feeling of relief. The first thing I did was get up and looked at the dining table area, and sure enough, two chairs had been moved away from their normal resting positions, and not just by a small amount, but significantly so. I also checked the rest of the communal areas in the villa to see if any doors or windows had been left open, but there was nothing. When my family got up, I told them all about what had happened, and unfortunately I was met with mainly skepticism, which I found a little upsetting at the time. To be honest, I think the experience affected me to the degree where I probably needed to go get counseling to really process it and to help get over it, but of course nothing like that was available at the time. One night when I was about 16, I walked outside onto my front porch after an argument with my mom and her husband. After about an hour of pacing and talking myself out of just leaving, the sun was setting, so I turned back and started heading back toward the house. When down the hill, about 150 yards, I see something slowly walking out of the tree line that looks to be a young woman in a dress. But the setting sun is shining off of whatever she's wearing. I don't think it's normal, and I'm a little freaked out, so I run inside and grab my binoculars. I come back, and she's only moved a few feet, walking very slowly, long, long steps. I focus in, and she's glowing. Gold. And she's dressed like a nun. Again, she was glowing gold. I've never seen her since, and I've spent the last 12 years searching for answers of what I witnessed that day. To begin with, I should explain some basic personal history. Real names will not be revealed, obviously. I have a family of five plus two spouses. My parents, my two brothers, my oldest brother's wife, and mine. Before getting married and moving out with my wife, I lived in the same house for 19 years. My parents bought it when I was like six months old, and I got married during college, so I've only ever known that house and my current apartment. I had some traumatic experiences when I was very young that are tied to one of the rooms in my parents' house, and then a few years later my parents had me move into that room. During my time in that room, I started having vicious nightmares, all involving me watching helplessly as the people that I loved were brutally murdered in graphic and creative ways in which one constant fixture was a figure that seemed to be observing everything and watching me from a distance, never directly interacting with the chaos, but always on the edge of my vision. This figure always looked the same. A tall mass of complete opaque blackness, with the exception of an antlered animal skull where its head should be. Anyway, when I went to college, moving out of that room, the nightmare stopped completely. I didn't have a single one until I came home for winter break and stayed in that room again. 
during that break, my then fiance stayed a few nights at my house with me. We slept in separate rooms, but both on the same floor. During the night, she texted me that she was having a panic attack and that she thought she was seeing a figure. When I asked what it looked like, she described the figure from my dreams exactly, and I told her to start reading Psalms in the hopes that it might help. She immediately felt better. Not sure if it was because of the scripture itself or if it was just a placebo, but I am a firm Christian, so I believe that it helped. We talked for a while about it before deciding to keep an eye out for more spooky shit. That night, I had the worst nightmare of my life. The next morning, I felt numb and out of commission, and I didn't fully recover until the next day. Every time I've gone back to that house since, I have felt an overwhelming, malicious presence there. It has the effect of weighing down on everything. It kind of feels like cotton in your ears, and making everything feel super depressing. Recently, there was another development. My grandfather passed away this last semester, and my grandmother moved into the house with my parents. She's a troubled person, and she brought a lot of toxicity and conflict to the home. Last time I was there with my wife, we immediately felt something horrifyingly evil. I've always had a sensitivity to spiritual things, and it was like nothing that I have felt before. I think that it was feeding off of the conflict in the house and making things worse. My cat, who we had brought with us, immediately slipped into what looked like a super depressive state. She wouldn't play or do anything, no matter how hard we tried. The kicker was the time that I decided to try something. I walked into my old room, the one tied to my traumatic experiences, and tried to feel for any sort of extra bad energy. It was tangible. My mom and I had repainted that room the last time I was down there, and it felt very cathartic, but the power was still ever-present. On an instinct, I touched a wall in the room and immediately had violent visions reliving my trauma, except the spirit was there, watching and seemingly gloating. It felt like it was trying to rub what had happened in my face like a look-what-I'm-capable-of sort of thing. My wife told me that I went white as a sheet and began shaking and crying, but I don't remember it. It behooves me here to add that I have seen several therapists about my traumatic experience. I don't think it was a PTSD flashback, as I've mostly worked through everything and am pretty mentally stable now. I'm relatively certain that the presence in my childhood home is evil, even demonic. I've talked to my mom, and I get the sense that she doesn't really believe me, but my wife and I are pretty certain of it. When I was in middle school, I went to a friend's birthday party sleepover where we did the typical girl things like painted nails, did makeovers, and watched a movie. It was all normal until my friend suggested that we make a Ouija board. On a sheet of paper, we scribbled out yes, no, goodbye, along with numbers and the alphabet. She told us all the rules, and we nodded in agreement that we would follow. I remember the first movement happening, and I looked across to the girl facing me, insisting that she had moved it. She said that it was not her that moved the clear pebble that we were all using as a planchette. We asked it dumb questions like who we each liked and if our crushes liked us. Typical middle school girl things. I don't remember much of these sessions other than a particular name, Wanda, and that we had asked her if she was a demon and that she had told us that she was not. After a while, this was no longer scary and we began to enjoy it more and more. I remember feeling so excited, like I just wanted to keep on playing as if it were a video game. The next day, I told my dad about it. My family was pretty open-minded about those things, so he wasn't mad or ashamed. He just wanted to make sure that we were all safe about it. Fast forward, and I was in my first year of college over at a friend's place for her birthday, and she had talked about how she found a Ouija board and that we should try it. I was a little hesitant, as now I realized the true implications. 
We eventually started setting boundaries, but I was still hesitant to believe that the planchette was actually moving on its own. My friend asked questions like, when's my birthday and what's my name? I shifted to questions not about myself, tending to ask about the entity rather than me. My friend suddenly asked if the spirit knew my deceased grandfather's name and it spelled out Lewis. I was in shock because none of my friends could have known that. I know that I hadn't directed the planchette to the letters, so I was surprised to see that it was correct. Later on, another friend of mine had said that she felt something grab her foot under the table. I was right next to her, and I didn't feel a thing. At that point, I was like, okay, let's say goodbye and call it a night. It was all just too weird. I've never had a truly bad experience, but it's still very creepy, to say the least. Not very far from my home, there is an abandoned place, which is my hideout. I honestly don't know what was in the place before it became abandoned. The place is a rather small, probably like 40 by 20 meter fenced off overgrown field with just one building. I can't tell what the building is either. It's a really small house-like place with no windows and one locked door. The field itself has a small, short sidewalk that has been taken over by nature. There's also a small hill in the field. You can tell that the place hasn't been visited for a really long time, because the grass in there is quite overgrown, and the house, fence, and path all have plants growing all over the place. Since it's currently spring, a lot of the foliage is growing and blooming, and there were some wildflowers in the area as well. Today I took some scissors and went to the area with the intent of picking some flowers to make a cute bouquet to put in my home. As soon as I entered the area, something felt off and I suddenly became paranoid. I ignored the feeling since I have mental illness which causes me to have random paranoia at times. Keep in mind though that it doesn't cause hallucinations. It was still unusual for me to feel paranoid there because I would usually go there to relax and be calm. It's basically my safe spot. I went on to look around and pick some flowers, but then I heard some footstep-like noises behind me everywhere that I went. I brushed it off again, assuming that it could have been an insect or a small animal like a hedgehog or a rabbit. I felt like I was being watched the entire time, but again, I assumed that it was just my random paranoia. The thing that scared me the most happened when I was about to cut a big, white, pretty flower. The only one of its kind in the whole area. As I was kneeling down to cut it, I suddenly felt a human presence behind me. This caused me to jump up, drop my bouquet out of shock, and yell out, whoa, and turn around. To my surprise, nothing was there. I was very confused, since the presence felt awfully real. I picked up my bouquet and went home. This is a story my grandma and grandpa told me a while back. I'm originally from a small town in Pennsylvania, and my grandfather was a state trooper for a majority of the time that he lived there before retirement. He took a course on hazardous waste removal. I can't remember his reasoning, but he was trained to be a guy in a hazmat suit who took toxic or irradiated waste away from certain locations. One night, while he and my Nana were asleep, he violently jolted straight up to a sitting position in his bed, still asleep. He pointed to a chair in the corner of his room and said to my Grams, who had been awoken by his movement, Mary Lou, he's sitting right there in the chair. Do you see him? My Nana was freaked out, so she tried to get him to lay back down in the bed, which took a few minutes, but eventually he was back to sleeping soundly. In the morning, my pop said that he saw death sitting in the chair in his room staring at him, and he took that as an omen that he was going to die very soon. 
About two months later, an incident at Three Mile Island occurred, and the police force out there asked my pop's station to send all of his people there who had hazardous waste training to help get it cleaned up. My pop decided to take two weeks off and take a trip to Mexico with my mom and uncle because of the dream that he had had. And when he got back, many of the people that he had known at his office had some kind of radiation poisoning that eventually killed them. I don't tell it as well as they do, but I thought it was an interesting story. When I was younger, my parents had gotten divorced. My dad was an abusive alcoholic who drained my mom out of a lot of money, so my mom and I left at the time. My aunt offered to let us stay at her house until we got back on our feet. Now, my aunt lives in the countryside. It's miles of farmland and a few houses every now and then. Her neighborhood is small, but everyone keeps to themselves. The area my aunt lives in is called The Base. Apparently, soldiers were housed there, and eventually died and were buried on that land. Don't know the exact history, though. Driving to her place at night is super creepy and confusing. You can easily get lost, so everyone aims to reach home before the sun sets. Now back to my story. My aunt had a second house, not too far away, where her family would go to do gardening and just chill out sometimes. My cousins and my aunt thought it would be a great idea to spend a night there. The house was an old, abandoned Baptist church converted to a house that my aunt had inherited. The previous owner was a seer woman and would do readings and even give exorcisms for people. My aunt took care of her when she was ill, therefore she gave the house to my aunt. The inside was run down, one couch for about ten of us, yeah, it was a big family, and a dirty bathroom with an annoying leaky pipe. Light barely entered the house during the day. It also gave an eerie vibe to it, because being in that house or on the land, it was always dead silent despite being surrounded by nature. That night, we all had these little rooms to sleep in, with there being so many of us that we had to share. My mom and I were in one room when I woke up to the sound of the wooden door being creaked open. I turned to see my mother upright, shaking and obviously full of fear. No one came through the door, but you could hear these loud, heavy footsteps around and inside the house. It woke everyone up, so we all huddled in the living room. All of a sudden, the lights cut off. We lit some lamps, and my uncle was getting ready to check on the noise outside when a loud banging came at the front door. It was around 1 a.m., and this place was completely deserted. We all stood still and quiet, and then the banging grew even more violent. The door began to shake, and a guttural, demonic voice was asking to be let in. Panic and terror struck all of us. My younger cousins began to scream and cry because the voice was unnatural, pure evil. The adults sent us into one room, and they formed a prayer circle in the middle of the living room. Everyone's backs were turned to the window, but I was the only one facing it, and I remember very clearly seeing a tall man with horns and a red aura looking back at me from outside. He was smiling at me, motioning me to come toward him. He had these long, black fingernails that he began to scrape the window with. At this point, everyone could hear it, but by the time they turned to the window, he had vanished. However, all the doors started banging and the windows were rattling. We kids all ran out to the living room and joined the prayer circle, reciting the mantras for my religion, and then suddenly, it stopped. The sun was now peeking in. It was 6 a.m. Everything felt like an hour, but we couldn't account for the rest of the time that had passed. We stayed for a few months in my aunt's original house without ever visiting that second house. My mom eventually got remarried, so we moved. It's been about 17 years or so since that incident, and we rarely visit my aunt, like maybe once or twice a year. Since then, however, the house has been demolished. 
My aunt has said that strange things occurred whenever she was on that land after that incident, and she felt like she was being watched. She couldn't handle it, and they eventually sold the land, too. When I was a child, my family often spent the weekends or the holidays at my grandmother's house. As a typical traditional Malay house, the house was made out of wood and was quite huge. Not a surprise, since my father does have a lot of siblings, nine of them. It wasn't just my immediate family. Most weekends or holidays, even my uncles and aunt would be there too, along with their family. Sometimes there would be around 50 to 70 of us inside that house. It was truly one of my fondest memories, where the entire huge family would sit together to have dinner or celebrate birthdays or whatever. One day, my grandmother fell sick. The doctor simply told us that her health was deteriorating since she was quite old at the time, but that she required no hospitalization. My dad and his siblings all made up their mind that my grandmother should stay with them. Every month, she would stay with a different one of her children at their house. I remember she stayed the most at my house, since it was the biggest at that time. I was happy, since she was a great storyteller and a great cook. In the meantime, my father and uncles hired a nearby neighbor to take care of and clean my grandmother's house every once in a while. Unfortunately, her health continued to decline. She told my father that she wanted to stay in her old home. At first, we didn't like the idea with her being alone in that house, especially with her declining health. After much discussion, my eldest uncle decided to build a house directly in front of my grandmother's house for him to stay in. In the meantime, they would rent a nearby house so that he or my cousins could visit her every day. My father and his siblings also agreed to hire a nanny for my grandmother so that she would never be alone. Fortunately, despite no one having been staying in the house for about two years, it was relatively clean. It had been almost a week since my grandmother returned to her own home. The weekend was coming, and my father decided to bring back the tradition of staying at my grandmother's. That Friday night, around two of us were there, and that night strange things began to happen. The first to notice that something was off were my cousins. They were all the daughters of Dad's youngest sibling. They were always cheerful, but at that time, I remember their faces almost always looking terrified. I chalked it up to them just being kids, which was ironic since I was only around ten myself at that time. Then, as I walked past their bedroom, I heard through the thin wall that the girls complained to their parents that they had noticed a few shadowy figures, which had been all over the house. My uncle tried to convince them that it was just their imagination. I decided not to care much. I was too tired and sleepy. That night, while I was sleeping, I remember waking up and staring above and seeing something terrifying. Just so you know, a traditional Malay house rarely has a ceiling. The house beam was exposed, and you can see the inside layer of the roof. During my sudden awakening, I saw something like a shadow sitting on the house beam. I had to rub my eyes to see, and after a while I began to make out what it was. It was some sort of creature or something. Am I still dreaming? I thought to myself. I was utterly terrified. I could see the creature, but it was like my brain failed to see exactly how it looked. Sometimes it would look like a lion, then a crocodile, then a huge bird, or some other kind of animal. And then it looked at me. All I could remember was its huge red eyes and a wide grin filled with fangs. I tried to scream, but my voice stuck at my throat, and my body felt stiff as if I were paralyzed. All I could do was slowly pull up the blanket and hide my body underneath it, and force myself to go back to sleep, hoping that it was a nightmare. The next day, as I sat alone at the stairs, trying to get rid of the memories of what happened, from the corner of my eyes I could sense that someone or something had been peeking out from the toilet area looking at the living room. It appeared to be a child, 
or was the size of a child, with pale, gray skin. Another time I was sitting in a chair in the living room. At first I thought it was just my imagination, but it happened throughout the day and the night. That same child. Then I heard my aunts talking with each other. It turns out that I wasn't the only one who had noticed it. The entire family had seen it too. Or rather, we could only see it through the corner of our eyes. When we all turned to look at it directly, it disappeared. Some decided to check it out themselves, and yet, nothing would ever be there. My uncle quietly told us that when a house was abandoned, there will always be something that will live there. That house had been abandoned for two years before, so obviously, something had moved in. And we were all simply intruders. He told us that if we didn't bother them, they wouldn't bother us. That night we all prayed together, as well as recited some holy prayers. Yet I could still see the little stalker, and I could begin to notice a few shadows around the house that did not belong to the furniture or to the other people living there. Worse for me was at night. I woke up again, and this time the thing was already grinning at me with what I assumed a hand or finger poking at my cheek. It didn't feel solid at all. It felt more like a cloud of smoke. Again, I tried to scream, but my body felt stiff. Like before, I could only slowly pull my blanket to cover my head and force myself back to sleep. I never dare to sleep at that house ever again. Anytime we ever went back to my grandmother's house, during either weekends or holidays, I simply stayed at my uncle's house that was right in front of it. Yet every time I entered there, I could still sense the small figure poking its head out from the bathroom wall and the shadows that would be moving around. My grandmother passed away around eight years ago, and since then we never have had reason to stay at that house. Now, the house was downsized while I was at university, yet it still has the original layout of the lower area. They only actually got rid of the upper area. I asked my father why not simply demolish the entire building. He then told me that even getting rid of the upper area was difficult. Workers were pushed by nothing, and electronics and engines would always malfunction. In the end, they decided not to touch the bottom area and just continue to use it as storage. This happened about a year ago in a park near my house. My brother and I are very spiritual and believe strongly in this type of stuff. I had this one Ouija board for a few years now, gifted to me by my old stepdad. We decided to use it one night and got in contact with a ghost. It went pretty well, and we did it again a week later. We talked to a new ghost, and the ghost from the first time. It was pretty cool and insane to experience something so real. They were very nice, and we were very respectful since we take this stuff seriously. Toward the end, we asked that they would not follow us home and that they would let us leave. They agreed, and we said goodbye. They moved the planchette, therefore they said goodbye with us. It seemed to be all going normal when we left, until my brother started noticing a weird feeling in our home, and on top of that, he said that one day he was hanging out in the living room and felt something in the room with him. It was on the couch where he was sitting, and he could see a cabinet door that he left open in the kitchen. He asked out loud that if someone was there to please close that cabinet door. And they did. After I got home, he told me this, and we busted out the board again. I know that you shouldn't use the board in your home, but I felt like we needed to know what was going on. We asked if the ghost who was in our home was the ghost from the park. The planchette moved to yes. Fast forward a year today, and we still live in the same house. We have a few experiences with ghosts and spirits in our home, but never the one from the park. Plus, I never go to the park anymore. My question to you guys is what made this follow us home? 
We did everything we were supposed to do, had a very friendly encounter, and they moved the planchette to say goodbye. I read that that's usually all that you need to do. But we did all that, and it still didn't work. I don't believe that the ghost was negative or evil, considering that they just left our home after a while. Or at least I think, since I don't feel them here anymore. My brother is convinced that the ghost was messing with us, since during the conversation when we asked their religion, they just muttered out a bunch of nonsense. I guess that could be it. But I'm wondering if there could be another reason that they followed us home. Back in the early 80s, my then-boyfriend moved into an apartment in Brockport, New York to be closer to his college. It was a nice two-bedroom. The building was about five years old. It overlooked the parking lot of some plazas, with a burger monarch that he worked part-time at. Every night, from the time we moved in until I moved out, I had one of three creepy dreams. One involved being back at my parents' house, where the stairs up to the attic are in my closet, and either an infestation of snakes or something oozy and rotting was sort of slurping its way to the stairs to make its way down. The second dream was of being lost and unable to find the apartment building. The big kicker dream involved it being moving day, and as I walked around trying to decide where to hang the spice shelf, I noticed black and red writing and smears on the walls. I remember thinking to myself in the dream that they should have been painted over. The night before I moved out, the dream continued with me being in my bedroom and there was a guy in a hooded robe standing and leaning against the doorframe watching me. I woke up when Keith got home from his work shift and he asked me why I didn't wave back. See, he had one of those great hooded velour bathrobes and he had waved at a hooded figure in our bedroom window thinking that I had gotten up to watch for him coming home. I wasn't standing there and wasn't even awake. When we were moving out, him back to the dorm and me to a different branch of my company, we found a little medallion with some of the glyphs that I had seen on the wall in my dreams. Luckily, who or whatever it was didn't follow me, and a friend warded the heck out of my new bedroom. When I was in middle school, my mother and father did not live together. Eventually, we all moved into this apartment together in the local town. The local town is peaceful, calm, and barely any crime happens here. Obviously, when you're a kid, you can get scared of the dark and stuff like that. However, this wasn't just being afraid of what lurks in the darkness because there was actually something watching me as I fell asleep. The first night I slept there, I just kept getting the feeling as if something was staring at me from the hallway. My bed was almost completely centered to where the door was, and my door was always open so I would always be able to see what was outside. And I would just stare, always, down the hallway, thinking that something was looking back at me. It wasn't long after that before I started actually having paranormal encounters. The first paranormal encounter I ever had, one night I was sleeping in my bed. I remember feeling like something was watching me again, except this time, I rolled over to see a large, black, shadowy man standing in my doorway. My eyes began to tear up, and I hid under my sheets, but this strange pressure came over my body. It was almost as if I couldn't breathe or talk, and then my ears would start ringing, and I would fall asleep with a snap of a finger. Then I would have this nightmare of my parents coming into my room slowly, coming over to my bedside table and screaming at me. Their faces would just rot away into this deep, black shadow face which I named Black Eyes. I would then wake up, usually in a completely different room, not knowing what I was doing. Sometimes I would be standing in the bathroom or laying on the couch in the living room. A few times I would be standing over my parents' bed, just looking at them. 
This event reoccurred more times than I can even count. Then, finally, my family began to notice the figure as well. My mother at the time would have friends over and they would say something like, Did you just see that man walk down your hallway? She would see it too. The same thing that I saw that would stare at me and put me to sleep at night. There would be strange events around the apartment, such as the TV changing channels, random phone calls from unknown numbers in the middle of the night. One of the most random occurrences in the house would be the random, horrible smell of death coming from the bathroom. This happened about once a week at a random hour. Nobody could figure out why the bathroom would smell like rotting death, and no matter how hard my mother attempted to clean the bathroom, the smell would not go away until about two hours later. It would just randomly disappear, with no explanation as to what it could have been. Many people who came over would see this shadow figure. My father didn't want to believe it, as he didn't believe in ghosts. But my mother was fully prepared. She had lived in a haunted house before and wasn't surprised by what was happening. Nobody would act like they believed me when I tried to tell them what I was seeing and why I was sleepwalking at night, but in reality, I think my mother was scared. She didn't want to tell me, with me being a kid and all, that I was possibly being possessed by this shadow man and being forced to walk around the house at night. Then came one night when we had to call the police. There was music coming from downstairs around 1 to 2 a.m. We knew that the downstairs neighbors had just moved out of the apartment, but we were awoken by this church-type music. We informed the police, and they came down to the apartment only to find a locked door. They busted it down to find absolutely nothing but music on a track playing by itself in the middle of the room. We were informed of this, and that only created more of a mystery. It was evident by that point that there was something in that apartment. Something dark. Something that didn't have good intentions. Eventually, after a few years, we decided it was time to move out. We had gotten a puppy, and she was barking down the hallway at nothing, and one night a plate fell onto the ground from the cabinet. It was time to go. The final night in the apartment, my mother and I both awakened to a horrible noise of what sounded like a chainsaw destroying the kitchen cabinets. We both ran out to turn on the lights and find absolutely nothing. We both look at each other like, did you hear that? But couldn't say anything and went back to bed. It was completely terrifying. I'm not sure what we were dealing with at this apartment. I'd like to say that it was just a ghost, but it seemed powerful. In 1996-97, I lived in a fairly old terraced house with a cemetery at the end of a road. Cliché, I know, but it's an important detail. Nothing remarkable about the house or the area, it was just convenient for college. Anyway, I was up late one night on the PC in my bedroom, which looked out onto the street. It was about 2 or 3 a.m. For whatever reason, probably to give my eyes a rest, I wandered over to the window and looked down at the road in the direction of the cemetery, although it was too far down the street for me to actually see, and I saw three people walking slowly down the road. I could see that they were quite old and appeared to be dressed in funeral clothes, which, given the hour, was weird. There were two women and a man. I put their ages at about 80, and the woman in the middle was being steadied or guided by the other woman and the man as they came closer. I got the impression that she was upset. My first thought was that given their age, she had recently buried her husband and grief had caused her to behave slightly irrationally. It was all interesting enough for me to carry on watching as they got closer to the house. Just outside the front door of the house was a street lamp. I continued to watch them as they made their way past, but when they got to the lamp post, they all stopped, and the upset woman in the middle looked up at me and grinned. This is where it got even weirder. 
The grin became a sort of grimace, and if there was any color in her face to start with, it was now dead white. At that point, I realized that I was staring right into her eyes, but her eyes were pitch black. If you've ever crashed a car, the final split second before you make impact seems to drag out as you process more information than normal in the time frame. It was that sort of scenario. I'm sure that we only made eye contact for a second, but it felt like several minutes as my peripheral vision faded and I felt like all I could see were those two black holes in her face drawing me in. The distance between us didn't change, but somehow it felt like she was coming closer. At that point, the two people with her were just continuing to look down the road as if they were frozen, but waiting for this woman to finish with whatever she was doing. I was suddenly hit with this intense feeling of dread and panic, so I threw myself to the floor. As soon as I had broken away from her gaze, I felt pretty stupid that this upset old woman, who clearly needed help, had spooked me so badly. I looked out the window again, and there was no sign of them. If you lived in Canada, then you know that there's a lot of countryside out here, along with forests. Most of the abandoned buildings you might come across are found there. I was 16 when this happened. I grew up mostly in the rougher part of the capital. Yes, even Ottawa has its tough spots, and one is known as Vanier. While it's no Detroit, it's still where most of the poor, along with other drug addicts and homeless, live and stay. I've been through plenty of stuff that a lot of people would say is scary, but this is something that still to this day, at 21 years of age, does not sit well with me. I was with my buddies at a warehouse of sorts. It was pretty deep in the forest. We were drinking and talking when one of my friends brought up the old story of a haunted farm near that spot. He went on about how the guy who got him in brought him there to scare the crap out of him. I want to add that when they went, he did confirm that his friend was the one who was messing with him, but he still said that something was off about it, so we started making jokes. And then I made a joke that got him really serious. I think I said something along the lines of, there's a ghost in there with Betty White making a porno. He then looks me in the eyes and tells me, no, something is messed up in there. I don't care what, but I felt it. Me being the jerk that I am, I joked about how he was being the wuss and that the only thing you really have to fear is fear itself. He then convinced me to go to this haunted barn. In retrospect, I should have just shut up right there and then. Next thing I know, we're heading to the barn. We get there and it's me, my friend, plus this guy that I don't really know but he was with the group. We walk in, the three of us. Me and the other guy start loudmouthing, right? Wild stuff like, hey Casper, what's poppin'? And first spirit that comes out gets bopped on sight. I'm not joking when I say that we get halfway in when these heavy doors shut on us. Those big barn doors, the old ones that took some effort getting them open in the first place, let alone having them swing closed like that. We go to push them open only to find out that they were stuck. So we immediately turn to my friend and start grilling him over trying to trip us up over some fake ghost crap, while Random that was with me starts turning on his flashlight on his phone. I'm asking where our mutual friend is, who I thought was helping him, until I noticed my friend is straight tearing up, which causes me to start freaking out. And I mean freaking out. I'm banging on the door, trying to get homeboy to help, while big homie is acting like a statue. I get a weird feeling on my shoulder. I start to freeze up, and all I hear to my side is scared, as if it were some kind of taunt. I spin around, seeing the same scene as from when I had started freaking. The guy pushing on the door, my friend staring off into nothing. As I'm asking if anyone heard that, the guy pushing the door starts spazzing, saying something in Spanish, I think. 
I grab him, telling him to calm down, while he's giving me this look like he just got shot. I'm sitting there trying to snap him out of his funk. Then my friend starts ramming into the door over and over really hard. I thought he was going to hurt himself. It was dark. I can't tell exactly what was being thrown around, but I can tell you that a lot was going through the air. We just started hearing crashes from all sides. I even got hit with something. I still have a scar to this day on the left side of my chin and my left shoulder. Then the screaming. It was like three chicks were getting cut up. It was awful. I won't lie, I'm not going to act tougher than I am. I started passing out for the first time, being the most bizarre feeling. My friend grabs me and the random guy, both of us not seeing that he did get the door open. When we got out, I threw up, while the random dude said something that I didn't catch and then just took off. My friend and I looked at each other and started walking back. The entire way he was explaining that he had no part in this. He kept swearing it up and down. I kept ranting about how that this was impossible, and that there was no lock on the door, so how was it even locked? And that caused him to freak out more. I had to go to the doctor to get stitches for whatever it was that flew into me while we were in there. When I told the doctors what happened, which I had to say what happened, but really I should have just made something up, because it could have been anything. And when I told them what did happen, they looked at me as if I were crazy upon my explanation. They actually made me go and see a shrink for a bit, due to my outlandish claims. After a while, they let me off the hook, thinking that I wasn't crazy. All I know is that I was sober that night. Last time I checked, two beers don't make you trip out. And random dude is refusing to tell us why he was screaming. Now, for a bit of comparison, when I was 15, I had a shotgun pointed at me and then pressed into my stomach, being threatened that they would pull the trigger. But that's simple. I'm about to get blown up, and that's gun plus angry dude equals body. But that night, I could not explain, nor could I control or fight back. That night fills me with a terror that has changed my life. And I see how rooms and dark places that I didn't know what was happening or how to react to or defend are the reasons to this day that this was one of the most horrifying experiences I have ever had. Don't get me wrong, getting a gun pointed at me got me on the path where I'm trying to change my life. But I can't change not being able to walk in the dark around my house and my refusal to be in dark rooms. I had just moved into a new place, and I was living alone. I bought a Ouija board and played with it my first night there, by myself. Nothing really happened, so I stashed it in my dresser under some old jeans and forgot about it. A few weeks later, I was having a party and suggested that we all play with it. Everyone agreed. I went to get it, but it wasn't there. I was dumbfounded. I'm pretty tidy. I know where I put it, but I could not find it. I couldn't explain it, so I just said that I had misplaced it. I had basically forgotten about it by the next morning. Fast forward six months. As I'm going to bed, I lie on my stomach. I slide my arms under my pillow to get comfy. My hand hits something. It's the planchette. I have no idea how it ended up there. I threw it out, and I have never seen it again, but I fear that whatever happened with the board and the fact that I was an edgy teen opened something up. I was into all that black magic crap. I've done lots of rituals with seemingly no results. There's a lot more to this story. Basically, my roommates and I were terrorized in two separate houses by something that we cannot explain. Like it was following us. All I know is that it looked like a little girl, but I don't think that it was. I never believed in this kind of stuff, but it's hard to deny what we all experienced.
A few years ago, my mom was sleeping downstairs, and she had an encounter with something inhuman. Anyways, I used to always get scared at night, and I would knock on their door to sleep with them. And one night, my mom heard a knock on her door, and she assumed it was me, so she said, Come in, while still half asleep. She heard the door open, and heard something quickly patter across the ground and jump on the bed, and it began whispering in her ear and mimicking her voice. She freaked out, and opened her eyes, only to see a very skinny, small, webbed-looking creature running out of the room. Me and my dad awoke to her screaming. We believe the house was haunted because we all had paranormal experiences there. We believe it came to be haunted because the previous owners performed satanic rituals, etc. When I showed her that skinwalker picture that kind of went viral, she said they looked really similar. But we don't know if this was a skinwalker or a malvoyant spirit. For some context, I live in an apartment with three other people while we go to college, but it's currently just me until January since the others went back home. I was singing a song that got stuck in my head when I heard whistling from the kitchen at the same time to the same tune. I thought one of the other roommates may have come back early, so I shouted out to them, but didn't get a response. I went to the kitchen, which is only just a few feet from the bathroom, and no one was there or anywhere else in the apartment. I checked the hallway outside, but didn't see anyone or hear a door open and shut in the few seconds that it took for me to get to the door. The whistling was very airy, as if it was someone who couldn't whistle very well. This isn't the first thing that happened to me in the last few weeks, but it's definitely the weirdest. It could just be my imagination, but it sounded like someone was directly outside the bathroom door, whistling toward it. The other thing that happened was far less weird, and could have just been me not paying attention. But I came back from work to find that the lights in my roommate's room were on, and the fan was blowing out at the door. Even though no one had been home, and the other roommate's families live quite a long ways from here. I asked where they were, and all of them sent back replies, showing that they were nowhere near the apartment. When I was 13 or 14, I was staying in a hostel in Ireland. This hostel was directly next to, supposedly, one of the most haunted places in Ireland, an abandoned mansion. In fact, the hostel was built from the bricks of the mansion. There was a story that a widow cursed someone in there, and when they died, they remained. After hearing this, being a young and dumb kid, I decided to taunt the ghost. Big mistake. Nothing happened after I taunted the ghost, until I went to bed. That night, in the very right side of my bed, I heard light breathing. I paid it no mind because I've had experiences before, and breathing was not a huge alarm for me. I eventually fell asleep, and then I got a phone call on my phone at 3 to 5 a.m. Likely family from back home in the U.S. I didn't answer the call, and I tried to go back to sleep. But there was a problem. My comforter had fallen off the bed, to the right side of the bed, and the breathing was loud and raspy now. At this point I was frightened because I had never heard breathing that loudly before, and it just wouldn't stop. Needless to say, I didn't get my comforter out of fear, and it was a good thing that I didn't. In the morning I was shocked by what I saw. To the right of my bed was the comforter laying on the ground, and it looked as if there was a human underneath it. I could make out the arms, legs, and head. To this day, I genuinely believe that if I had reached for my comforter, something would have reached back.
When I was 13, I fell in love with a guy who said that he was 17. His family was from Haiti. I was a tomboy back then, so I was just excited to have somebody, anybody, like me. We started a romance. I was with him until about 16. He always snuck me around, and I obviously hid him as well. My mom would kill me if she knew that I had a boyfriend at that age. I would cut school and sneak into his house to, well, you know. His grandma, who he lived with, always creeped me out. She was indigenous and wore long, African-looking dresses and hated me. She saw me a few times and would show, outwardly show, disgust. I never understood why. Fast forward. I was 16. My boyfriend was acting weird. I got suspicious when I received some prank phone calls. I asked to see his phone logs. Long story short, I called some weird numbers and found out that he was having relations with 12 to 13 year olds, still, even though he was with me. I was so angry at this point, he was 20-ish, so I went to the police. I don't know why, I just did. They looked him up and down and told me that he wasn't 20. He was actually 27 and had had former charges for statutory rape. They asked me to tell them where he worked. Turns out, he was a pedophile the entire time. No wonder his grandma was disgusted at me. I looked like a child, and she knew his age. He was arrested, and I was asked to testify. This is where the scary stuff happens, by the way, if you've made it this far. One week before testifying, I was sleeping in my bed. I had a full-sized bed against the wall. This is important because on the other side of that wall was my mom's room. As a child, I would knock on the wall when I got scared and she would come and rescue me. That night, I was on my back when I woke up with sleep paralysis. I couldn't move. I knew because I frantically tried to reach for the wall and couldn't. My limbs felt abnormally heavy and wouldn't budge. I felt serious pressure on my chest, although there was nothing on it. And then I saw it. On my left, standing or kneeling next to me, was what I would call or only describe as a demon. He didn't give me a violent vibe. What was terrifying is it was ominous. Smug, even. He looked male, dark skin, almost like a seaweed green. Texture was bumpy, rigid. I just remember extremely sharp features. Pointy nose, pointy head, pointy chin. Very triangular looking. One thing I absolutely cannot forget is the smile. He has an ear-to-ear -ear grin. A confident and perverted smile. I was terrified. Unable to scream. And then I felt it. He shoved his disgusting fingers down my throat. This is where it gets almost perverted. It was a vigorous motion. He enjoyed it. It hurt. I closed my eyes and didn't know what else to do but pray. I'm not even religious, and I just prayed and prayed and begged for help. I felt the pressure lift off of my body, and my mouth was suddenly clear. I was too scared to move or open my eyes, so I pretended to continue to sleep and ignored the taste of iron in my mouth. I woke up the next morning absolutely mortified. I couldn't speak. My throat felt as if I had swallowed glass. There was blood on my pillow and in my mouth. I ran to my mom. I tried to voice what had happened. She was scared for me, but told me that it was all a dream. I didn't testify. I was scared to speak, and my throat hurt. I was just so stressed with everything, I wanted nothing to do with anybody. He went to jail anyways, because at that point, it was the state against him, not me. Time passed. I grew terrified to sleep alone. I always felt like the demon was in my room. I never saw him again, but I felt his presence everywhere I went. I would sleep facing the door and pray before bed, always. 
I would hear it in my dreams, sometimes telling me, I'm still here, mocking me as I would run down the stairs in my dream and my legs would grow heavy. I would try to get out of my house, and I had to fight my body to move in my dream. There was even a time when I was at an ex-boyfriend's house years later, and I was brushing my teeth, and all of a sudden out of nowhere felt the hairs on my body rise, and I had this insane panic knowing that the demon was there. He was literally hovering on me. I couldn't see him or smell him or anything, but I felt his presence. I ran to my ex's bed and asked him to sleep on top of me the entire night to protect me. I had never in my life broken down like that. I can't explain it. I just knew that the demon was there trying to break in again. So I was about 22 when I got a phone call from the pedophile ex. He found me and called to check on me. Despite him being sick, he did love me in his own way, I think. I don't know. I don't feel like digging into it. Point is, he found me and called. He thanked me for not testifying. He said it saved him more time in jail. I had to ask. I asked him if he knew anything about demons. I then told him what had happened and asked if he could do anything with it because I remember him telling me things about his grandma doing hoodoo. He was silent. Then he finally told me without many details that he didn't exactly know what his grandmother had done, but all he knew was that a few weeks before the trial, she had come to where he was living with another African-looking guy in very indigenous clothing and asked for a few of my things. He gave them my hairbrush with my hair on it and other trinkets that I had left behind. He told me they took it and left. He doesn't know anything else. I was livid. I never spoke to him again and changed my number. I'm 30 now. I'm still scared to sleep alone. I don't feel the demon anymore, however, but I still have PTSD. I am still scared to have the door closed in my room. I still think about it every night before bed. I pray before bed. Although I never saw him again, I still feel something heavy. Not as bad as that time with my ex years ago in the bathroom, but it's more of a subtle heaviness. Three years ago at my last apartment, which I believe was haunted, I was always so terrified. I would have scary dreams, the type that happen in your bedroom so you're not really sure if it's a dream or if it's real because everything looks the same. I remember having the urge to run out of my apartment sometimes. Just run. I would be on the couch and I would feel that fight or flight feeling and just jet toward the door and stand in the hallway outside my apartment because I was terrified for no reason. Demons exist. I won't get into other small stories that I have now because they're really not major compared to this one. But I will also say, I think I have experienced angels as well. Small stuff like having lost things appear on my bed when I live alone or being in a dangerous environment and having a sudden feeling of I need to stop doing this now after seeing two pillars of parallel fog. If there's anything to feel good about, it's believing at least in the theory of opposites. If there's evil, which we know that there is, then there has to be good as well. So I always struggled with sleep paralysis, but one time, maybe three years ago, I woke up from my sleep, but I wasn't able to move at all. I saw a very slim, abnormally tall, black figure in the corner of my room. I looked at him. He was looking at me, his face down. When I looked at him, he just calmly walked away from my room, and I woke up. To this day, I still think about it. And I found out thousands of people all around the world see the exact same thing. I can't believe it's all psychological. How can everyone see the same thing? From China to Ireland, USA to Turkey? It doesn't make sense. 
I think that we all may have witnessed something otherworldly. In October of 2018, I was hospitalized for four nights. I was put in the surgical wing due to lack of beds and was in a four-person room with all rooms near me having four people as well. The last night of my stay was on the 31st, which of course was Halloween. Other than it being noisy from the firecrackers outside, followed by the heavy rain, it was uneventful. I was particularly restless that night and not having an easy time falling asleep. Just before midnight, and I remember looking at the clock seeing 11.47 because I couldn't fall asleep, I saw a figure in the window next to my bed. It was a massive black dog, like a long-haired husky with the reddest eyes that I have ever seen. It was such a deep, but at the same time bright, crimson. It was just staring at me, and I felt completely frozen. I turned over and covered my face, and when I looked over some time later, it was gone. I should note that I was on an upper floor with a roof landing outside my window, so no way could an animal have gotten up there. I ignored it, called the nurse, and asked for something to help me sleep. They told me I didn't need anything and would eventually sleep on my own. About half an hour later, I saw the same creature staring at me from inside a window within the hospital across from mine. I immediately felt sick and panicked, and as quick as I saw it, it was gone. Several minutes later, my wing went on lockdown. The doors all closed, and all I could hear were screams and nurses running. The screams and panic went on for four hours. I found out the next morning that a pregnant woman in the room next to mine had died from an adverse reaction to the medication that she had been given. She went into complete psychosis, and at one point was running through the halls, banging on everyone's doors, begging for help, and telling us that the nurses were trying to kill her. I will never get those sounds out of my head. I had no idea what hellhounds were until I got home and searched. I had no idea what hellhounds were until I got home and searched for what I had seen. I've let it lay dormant in my brain since then, but recently I've been having dreams where they show up, and it's terrifying. I'm so lost as to what to make of it, and terrified to make any assumptions. My first visit to this hospital was in 2018. After searching for the address for a while, I came across one that looked accurate enough and went on my way to that lost place with a friend of mine. We arrived, astonished by the size of the complex. I didn't do a lot of research before that. I just knew that it used to be a hospital and was built during World War II, and by the address, it seemed legit. On our way down from the parking lot to the lost place, our excitement was growing, but so was our anxiety for reasons that we just couldn't ascertain. We make our way onto the complex at the part where the main entrance was before, and the air felt really dense. My friend felt the same way, but we brushed it off as just being a bit nervous, just ourselves, and we started to walk past some buildings at the entrance, completely focused and being amazed. At some point, my pulse must have slowed down due to me being focused on trying to take in everything I was seeing, because I noticed that it increased in speed when we reached the buildings where I suspected that the patients would have been. It felt like there was strong electricity in the air that made me feel even more uneasy. That's when we heard a door slam behind us at one of the buildings. We, of course, completely froze. The sound came from a building that was pretty far away from us, and that sound was very loud. There was no wind at all that could have caused the heavy doors to slam like that. The trees weren't moving, nor did we hear anything else. Just one door that decided to slam shut on its own. 
We nervously chuckled and decided to move closer to the exit. I asked my friend if I should record this visit on my phone, and she agreed. We both turned on airplane mode and went on our way. Whether it was due to our anxiety, or us being too alert, or something actually being there, we would turn around or stop walking at the same time, asking the other if we had heard that sound. Sometimes the sounds behind us resembled soft footsteps. Other times, we would hear silent whispers that we couldn't quite make out. At some point, I began to question my sanity, but I knew that there had to be something there to make such specific noises, loud enough that my friend would also hear them, as I did. As we were walking toward the actual exit, we stopped to look at one building and we heard a very, very loud bang behind us, making our walking become very determined as we made our way to the main street. The bang was accompanied by other sounds that we couldn't define back then. Fast forward and both of us are at my place. We grab individual headphones and start to listen to the recording. And boy, was that some weird stuff. We both enabled playing mode before I hit the record button, but there were so many disturbances in the recording, distinct sounds like someone coughing, whispers, with clear vowels, that we couldn't quite make out the full words to. A woman's voice going, shh, breathing, and bleeps. I have to admit that we were freaking out a lot. I was almost crying because I found it to be so chilling. The thing that baffled us the most was the loud bang that made us leave. I swear to you, it wasn't there. At all. Not the bang on the recording that startled us so much that made us leave the place, but silent sounds? You can hear us being startled and agreeing to leave immediately, but no bang could be heard on that recording, and it's still not there. I held my phone the exact same way that I had been since I started that recording. I didn't put my clothes against one mic. The mics weren't broken after a test recording that we did. So there should be a banging sound, but absolutely there is not. And I have no clue why that is the case. That hospital is a really special place. From later experiences there, I have come to possible conclusions as to what kind of paranormal things occur. I live in South Africa with my family, and we recently moved into a two-story house. My room is upstairs. Simple room, really. Bed facing the sliding door. Just outside the sliding door, I have a small area where I can smoke. To my left, we have a view of our indoor pool, with an almost UV light type of effect. Now, to my problem. It's been two weeks in this new place, and something is following me. I know I sound crazy, but it breathes very, very hard. Last night I went to bed at around 11 p.m. after watching some memes on YouTube. I woke up with a rather foul smell. I honestly assumed I had farted in my sleep. But as soon as I stood up to open the sliding door, I felt it. I swear I am not crazy. I felt something breathing down my neck. And the smell got worse. I've been working at a funeral home for about a year as an assistant, and will be starting up my apprenticeship next month. I have had several weird encounters since working there, but nothing to write about until tonight. I got back from picking up a decedent around 8.30 p.m. I wheeled him into the prep room, and as I turned around to close the door behind me, I heard a man's voice. The voice either said, I'm here, or come here. I wasn't too freaked out. Weird stuff happens a lot. However, this is the first time that I have actually heard disembodied words. This isn't the most exciting story but I definitely thought that it was worth sharing.
This won't make sense until later in the story, but my brother's room is on the second floor of my house. He has a door that leads up onto the roof, and it's pretty high up, so there's no way to get up there. Anyways, this was when I was around 13 or 14. My twin brother got a Ouija board recently, and me and my friend always used it. One day we decided to play with it like usual, just because we were bored. My brother went into the shower, so it was just me and my friend in my brother's room. We started using the Ouija board, and nothing really happened. It starts moving, and I usually move it, or he does, because we were dumb kids. This time, I wasn't moving it, so I just assumed that it was him. For five minutes, nothing happened, but we started asking the spirit to do something to let us know that we were there. This is when it got weird. Outside the door in my brother's room, the one that leads to the roof, me and my friends started hearing humming and singing sounds. We got pretty scared and kept asking questions to the Ouija board. After that, there was a subtle banging or tapping kind of noise. One of the drawers in the dresser behind us opened. We said goodbye and put it away. Haven't used it since. So I found this old, abandoned, broken-down house in the woods close to where I live. I've only lived here about a year. I was alone walking around it, trying to see if I could have a peek inside. While I was walking around and whatnot, I felt a bit scared, but I pressed on. I found a way in, but it smelled so much of mold that I just decided not to bother. Anyway, the point of the story. When I was about to leave, I felt this sensation of sadness wash over me. I stopped and turned around and looked at an open window of the house from about 10 meters away. And I swear that there was a woman who stood there being in pain from the state of her house. I stared and was almost about to cry for a few moments as I walked away. But then I stopped and looked back again. I almost felt drawn to the house, not wanting to leave. But as soon as I got away from it and was walking back home through the forest, the feeling of sadness left. On a side note, the day before I had walked through a part of the forest where a lot of trees had been cut down and a lot of branches and bark were scattered all over the ground. There I also felt such sadness, as if the trees themselves were crying. As I'm writing this, I realize that I sound kind of insane, but I have never really felt this way before, and I feel normal like one day later, like today. There's a ghost inside of mine and my girlfriend's new home. We've heard stomping in the kitchen in the middle of the night, among lots of other things. The issue that I have is that I wonder why it never shows itself or does anything in my presence. I've come home to doors open and the animals in the corner shaking. Or I'll hear things in the other room falling and sure enough, there will be something on the floor, but it never does anything while I'm in the room. My girlfriend, however, has seen the ghost, has had it open doors that she was next to, and heard it whisper. Is my energy off-putting to the ghost, or does my girlfriend attract it through her fear? I do not fear the ghost, and view it as more of an annoyance than anything, whereas she is terrified of it. This is an encounter I experienced in the summer of 2009. I was born and raised in the plains of Texas, specifically in an area where black-eyed kids' sightings are prevalent. I had heard the stories, tales, legends, whatever you want to call them, since I was a young man, but never truly believed them. The black-eyed kids were mainly something I entertained as a joke, or something to get a rise out of people. 
This changed in the summer of 2009. It was a warm night in June. I was up late, around 2 a.m., as I typically like to stay up late, especially in the summer since it would be fairly warm even after the sun went down. I had just run up to the store to grab a big fountain drink and was returning into my house through the back door when I was approached by two kids, a boy and a girl. I was very startled once I realized that they were there, since I wasn't expecting to encounter anyone in my backyard so late at night. The little boy asked, could we come in? We need to use the phone, we're lost. This is when I noticed the blackness of their eyes. Both of them, so dark, they were like pits. This is also when my heart sank. I couldn't believe I was actually seeing them, that they were there, right in front of me. As I mentioned before, I had heard the legends of the black-eyed children most of my life, so there was no way I was going to let them in my house. I darted inside and locked the back door as quickly as I could. Once I was in, I ran upstairs and flipped on the lights to try and see if they were still outside. Thankfully, by then, they were gone. I had so much adrenaline pumping by that point, though, that I grabbed a weapon and began searching the house and making sure all doors and windows were locked. It took me hours to get to sleep that night, and it's an encounter that will stay with me for the rest of my life. These entities took the form of something most people view as innocent, weak, mild, and try to trick unsuspecting people and do God knows what with or to them. I'm just glad my reflexes kicked in and I was able to live to tell the tale. I just had the scariest experience I lost my ex over a year ago and had bought a Ouija board in desperation out of longing to communicate with him. I tried countless times, and it never worked, so I stored it away. Yesterday, my current boyfriend's good friend passed away. Suicide. I didn't know him very well. Today, I had a random thought to maybe try to communicate with him. I pulled out the Ouija board and asked to speak with him. It wasn't working until I closed my eyes, and then it started to move. It went to yes. I then asked it to give me a sign that it was really him. It went to the number nine. When I asked what this meant, it just kept going back to the number nine. As it's moving, I heard my cat hiss. I opened my eyes, and my cat was over the Ouija board hissing at it. My cat has hissed maybe twice in his entire life. I about pooped my pants and asked to say goodbye. I was already freaking out when I called one of my friends and they said, Nine is an upside down six. Now I am absolutely terrified. Ever since we moved to our new house, I hear someone playing in my son's room when he's outside. Generally, I just wrote it off as something he placed precariously that just fell or something, and then I saw it. Or her, rather. I was sitting on my couch talking with the wife about whatever we were going on about, and when I turned my head back to look at my wife, I saw a little blonde girl in a white dress peeking around the corner of our hall entrance that leads to my son's upstairs room. I immediately asked my wife if she saw it, but of course she was looking at me when it happened. It was basically right behind her. Just the other day I heard what I thought was my wife calling out, hey, as she was doing laundry. I got up to see what she wanted, and she had no idea what I was talking about and said that she didn't say anything. 
And she didn't hear anything either, even though the sound came from the area where she was, at the bottom of the stairs that lead to my son's room. Are there any Android apps or something that can help me communicate with the spirit that I believe is in this house? She seems playful, and sometimes I hear my son playing alone, talking to someone that isn't there, but when I ask him, he says he's just talking to his toys. I am currently sitting in my bed at 12.35 in my time zone right now and was watching a YouTube video a couple minutes ago. Without warning, I suddenly hear a scream. My first thought was that it was part of my video, but I checked and it was not. It sounded like it was from a man experiencing pure terror and agony. It was a single scream from the worst fear and pain imaginable that lasted two to three seconds and then silence. My dog started barking once I heard it. It was hard to explain, but it didn't sound like anything a human was capable of making. More like a much more convincing sound from a horror movie. I have heard some weird sounds around the house, mainly in the kitchen and dining room, since I moved in. I'm pretty skeptical about things like this usually, but that was like nothing I have ever heard before. Me and some friends went to an abandoned mental asylum at night, not really expecting much. We busted in through one of the boarded up windows, and when we were inside, we all heard talking. We figured that other people were there, so we followed the sound. We were walking down the hall and heard a woman whispering, Why did you take my baby? Over and over again. At this point, I was visibly shaking, and we all believed we found where the sound was coming from originally. We go to this room, and there was a huge cage. It looked like one of those pet carriers, only human-sized. I don't know what actually happened that night. I don't really believe that dead people were talking in there, but the sheer creepiness of it all was just too much. My dad and I decided to go to this store one day to buy incense, and we meet this woman that I think owns the shop, and she's weirdly interested in the color of my eyes. My eyes are a weird color, they're yellow and green, but she was telling me that they're so bright that they're deceiving. Well, fast forward to a few weeks later, and I'm in my room asleep. My mom is awake, and when I woke up, she told me that she saw a woman. Perfectly described her as the woman from that shop, astral projecting into our house, and went to my room and tried to take me. My mom had never went to that store, had never seen that woman, so that's how I know she wasn't lying. My mom and dad weren't on talking terms at that time. But ever since then, I get really weird nightmares involving her in them, and they occur every night, and I can't get them to stop. They always involve her taking me. I was in Pennsylvania exploring an abandoned mill slash factory that had been built in the 1800s at dusk. I was standing on a pile of limestone cinder blocks surrounded by tall grass and brush with a tree line about an acre away just after the sun had set while my friends were inside still. As I was climbing down, I heard a low guttural growl, not like a dog's growl or any type of animal for that matter. It was deep. It had much more bass to it. It was very disturbing and not like anything I have ever heard before. 
It sounded as if it were very close, but I didn't hear any brush moving. It freaked me out, and I booked it to my friend's house in the dark. 